Uh, good morning. This is Chief Sergeant Terrence Rafael Perez, uh, Chairman Rodriguez. Uh, sir, we have resolved the issue. Are you ready to start? Now I am. I'm ready. Okay, give us a second. The uh, Sergeant Terrence will go through uh, his opening and then we'll hand it over to you. Okay, thank you. Okay, and at this point, will sergeants please start their recordings? Computer recording the comments. comments. Thank you. Cloud recording good. Thank you. Backup is rolling. Thank you and good morning. And welcome to today's remote New York City Council hearing of the Committee on Transportation. At this time, would all council members and council staff please turn on their video. To minimize disruption, please place electronic devices on vibrate or silent mode. If you wish to submit testimony, you may do so at testimony at council.myc.gov. Once again, that is testimony at council.myc.gov. Thank you, we are ready to begin. Thank you to all the sergeant, sergeants and technicians who have been working so hard to be sure that again that all New Yorkers had the opportunity to follow the hearing uh, all at the council. Thank you all for joining our hearing today on the council's package of bills to support smart, safe and sustainable deliveries in the city. First, I'm going to turn it over to our com community council to go over some procedures items. Thank you. I'm Elliot Lynn, counsel to the Transportation Committee of the New York City Council. Before we begin, I want to remind everyone that you will be on mute until you're called on to testify when you will be unmuted by the host. Please listen for your name to be called. I will periodically announce who the next panelist will be. The first panelist will be from the administration, from the Department of Transportation, uh, Commissioner Hank Gutman, Deputy Commissioner for Transportation Planning and Management, Eric Beaton, and Assistant Commissioner for Intergovernmental and Community Affairs, Rebecca Zack, and from the Department of Buildings, Commissioner Melanie LaRocca. Uh, during the hearing, if council members would like to ask a question, please use the Zoom raise hand function and I will call on you in order. Unless otherwise indicated by the chair, we will be limiting council member questions to five minutes, including answers. Um, before I turn it back over to the chair, I would like to acknowledge that we've been joined by council members Diaz, Powers, Ku, Rose, Holden, Rivera, Reynoso, Levine, Brooks Powers, and Cabrera. Uh, Chair. Thank you, Elliot. I'm proud to be working with, with Speaker Corey Johnson, of course, his Chief of Staff Jason Goldman, Council Member Rivera, Power, Powers, and Reynoso to introduce the bills we are considering today. Since becoming chair of this committee, I have been a proponent of transportation policies that reduce congestions on our street and prioritize the safety of pedestrians and cyclists. And in that priority, I've been working very close, not only with Speaker Johnson, my colleague administration, but also with the public advocate board president, Gabe Brewer, Ruben Diaz Jr., and of course, Brooklyn board president, Eric Adams. The COVID-19 pandemic has shown us that we must take steps to make our public space work for everyone, especially with the increase in the number of trucks and vans making deliveries to our homes and businesses. Many of these vehicles double park while making deliveries, causing traffic congestion and creating potentially dangerous situations for cyclists and pedestrians. The status quo is simple, unacceptable. Now is the time for us to be proactive. One of the bills on today's agenda, which I have, is, which I have a sponsor with Speaker Corey Johnson, intro number 2282, is a bill that will require DOT to redesign our city's truck route network to improve safety, increase visibility, and reduce traffic congestion and emissions. The bill will also require DOT to consult with community stakeholders when redesigning the city's truck route network. 
the bill will require DOT to implement daylighting at each intersection, an intersection adjacent to the truck route network and review and replace truck route signals where necessary. This is just one example of the kinds of things we need to be doing to improve our street and I'm proud to sponsor this bill. Lastly, I would also like to highlight the importance of improving our streets so that they are more efficient, sustainable, and safe for all, especially for pedestrians and cyclists. During the unveiling of the 181st busway last week, we heard the mayor reaffirm his commitment to bring more initiatives like this to all underserved communities. I will also continue work alongside Mayor de Blasio, Speaker Corey Johnson, Brooklyn Borough President Eric Adams, my colleagues, and especially Riders Alliance to ensure we meet our Teddy Boss Lane miles by the end of this year before the new administration. Before we call on the administration, I would like to give the bill's sponsor an opportunity to make a few comments on their bills. First, Council Member Rivera. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I wanna thank Chair Rodriguez for holding this hearing on these bills today, which includes my legislation intro 2281, which would require large commercial buildings to develop delivery and servicing plans to reduce the impact deliveries have on our streets, our neighbors, and our environment. An estimated 1.8 million packages are delivered across the five boroughs each day. The surge in online shopping and deliveries brought on by the COVID-19 pandemic has only made it clearer that the way we handle freight and shipping in most American cities just isn't working for our 21st century economy. With my legislation, large commercial buildings in New York City would be required to both submit detailed plans for on-site loading and delivery management to the Department of Buildings and directly survey tenants to identify mitigation strategies. Building owners would be offered technical support <coughs> for the creation of an Office of Sustainable Delivery Systems within DOB. This bill aims to reduce congestion on streets and sidewalks, distribute delivery times more effectively, and has the potential to consolidate shipments, thereby helping our city run more sustainably and efficiently. We look forward to working collaboratively with all of the stakeholders involved, especially our workers who put exhaustive time into making sure we do the best we can with the current system in place. I hope all of my colleagues will support this legislation. And I wanna thank all of my colleagues who have bills in the package, council members Rodriguez, Reynoso, and of course, Speaker Johnson. And I wanna thank you, Mr. Chair, for the time. Thank you, Councilmember Rivera. Now let's hear from Councilmember Powers. Thank you, Chair Rodriguez, and good morning, everyone. I am City Councilmember Keith Powers. Thank you for giving me an opportunity to say a few words today about two bills of mine that are on the agenda here today. Um, the first one, uh, Intro 811, which would establish pedestrian flow zones in Times Square, and Intro 22, 20, 2277. It, which would reform the commercial loading zones as part of the council's effort to support smart, safe, and sustainable deliveries in New York City. The first one, intro 81811, is about improving the pedestrian experience in Times Square, in Times Square including guidelines for activity zone and pedestrian zone interaction, and ones that address street closures and signage, allowing the Department of Transportation to set up rules to address public safety concerns, and setting up a working group to coordinate on these issues. This legislation is an update to existing regulations, which is necessary to ensure the original intent of those regulations is honored and to codify ambiguities in the original bill about how commercial activity can take place. These pedestrian flow zones will create expectations and guardrails for where business transactions can take, can take place, making people feel safer and improving pedestrian flow, and it's well-timed with our safety. Right? The second bill, intro 2277, several reforms to 
the loading zones to make the delivery process more efficient and minimize negative impacts on other users and sidewalk. This legislation requires that all commercial loading zones are controlled by a muni meter, which will ensure delivery trucks are paying their fair share for using street space. It will extend the number of hours that commercial vehicles can park in loading zones from three to eight hours to reduce unnecessary idling. That often happens when a driver's time is up, but they still have deliveries to make. And to ensure commercial loading zones are kept open for commercial vehicles, this legislation will prohibit placard parking in commercial loading zones in the area south of and including 60th Street in Manhattan, obviously my district, and it will require construction permit applicants to maintain loading zone access or create tempor temporary loading zone loading zones when construction stage it would block an existing loading zone. It's time for our city's commercial delivery infrastructure to catch up to our 21st century needs. And I'm proud to sponsor this bill to address an issue that has long been a source of frustration for New Yorkers. And I look forward to hearing feedback today on that legislation. Thank you to Chair Rodriguez and everyone for your support and participation today. Thank you, Councilmember. Now let's hear from Councilmember Antonio Reynos. Councilmember Reynos, sir. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, I just want to um, thank uh, the Chair for putting this hearing together. Uh, my two bills are two bills that I'm sponsoring and looking to hear from the administration speak to two uh, important issues. One is the introduction of package rooms in any new construction um, and any major construction or development that happens um, in new buildings and again in, in new construction to older buildings. Uh, the package rooms will prevent theft, um, allow for deliveries to happen in a meaningful way, um, and also given the time and how we are now receiving most of uh, um, our purchases for mail, uh, making sure that our that the city is prepared um, uh, to, to handle that effectively. Uh, also asking for 25% of all street space or street parking be dedicated to loading zones so we could prevent the double parking um, the double parking that is dangerous for pedestrian cyclists and uh, vehicle drivers alike, um, but also uh, allowing for us to give space to uh, uh, companies and businesses that are uh, doing work for thousands of people as opposed to just one singular vehicle that may be parked uh, that, uh, you know, awards an opportunity only for that individual. So. I'm excited to hear from the Department of Transportation. I do want to say that we are in you know, the beginning stages of development of this legislation. I'm very excited to be able to come to a place where we can uh, finally start speaking to uh, the freight uh, and delivery um, legislation that we set forth. Thank you. Thank you, council members. Uh, before our- Chair, uh, I think Council Member Holden also wants to give an opening on his bill. Okay, Councilmember Holden, please. And I'm sorry, Councilmember, that I didn't call you before. That's all right. Uh, thank you, Chair Rodriguez. Uh, uh, be, uh, so I have a bill. Uh, before the pandemic, I visited a local firehouse on Myrtle Avenue in my district. Uh, it's called the Myrtle Turtles. Interesting uh, name for a fire company. But I had lunch with them to hear their concerns. And obviously, there were many. But one thing that stood out was their idea for stencils in the street that would help locate fire hydrants. Uh, illegal parking has become a real huge problem in the city, especially in my district. And um, you know, people are parking directly in front of the hydrants and, and our firefighters are telling me they're having trouble locating them, the hydrants. So in the event of, of a fire, time is of the essence. Seconds wasted trying to locate fire hydrants or struggling to hook them up uh, because someone is parked illegally could lead to lives lost. Um, so while we need our local precincts to address the scourge of illegal fire hydrant parking, my bill, intro 1819, would be beneficial in helping our firefighters locate a hydrant. Um, you know, it is common sense uh, solution to a serious problem. Uh, again, what it is essentially is a stencil in the street. It could be in the middle of the street. It could be a certain color um, of, of a hydrant, just so the firefighters um, 
could locate it. Uh, so I want to thank uh, Chair Rodriguez and Speaker Corey Johnson for allowing this bill to be heard. And I'm asking all my colleagues to sign on. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Council members. Uh, before uh, I would call the law, our lawyer to mention the law, I would like to say in Spanish that hoy nosotros estamos eh, eh, discutiendo un grupo de proyectos de leyes eh, donde tienen que ver eh, cómo nosotros podemos organizar mejor los deliveries de, lo, de los camiones eh, cuando llevan la comida a los diferentes lugares. Pero también en el día de hoy al proyecto de, entre los proyectos de leyes por primera vez se marcará eh, de un color diferente el área cerca de, la, eh, de las pompas para que los choferes también sepan a qué distancia visualmente que no se pueden parquear. Este pro, el conjunto de proyectos de leyes también tiene que ver con visión cero. Tiene que ver con nosotros garantizar de que los camiones que afectan las visibilidades eh, eh, no eh, lo sigan haciendo. Y al contrario, que se dediquen a áreas específicas donde esos camiones se estacionen para desde ahí eh, todo eso de eh, órdenes que se hacen online se puedan llevar a sus lugares. O sea, no es solamente hoy estamos analizando lo que tiene que ver con, con mejor eh, forma, sistema de los camiones hacer los delivery, pintar el área específica cerca de las pompas para que los choferes sepan a qué distancia no se pueden parquear, pero hoy también eh, con estas leyes que esperamos tener el apoyo de la ciudad de Nueva York, en este caso de la alcaldía, el de comisionado DST, también estamos buscando solución al problema de visión cero. Visión cero que lamentablemente todavía falta mucho por hacer, donde se pierden vidas de personas inocentes, no solamente chocándose cuando son chocadas por los camiones, sino también visión cero que nos afecta grandemente en los casos de hit and run, que nos afecta cuando... Eh, choferes eh, golpean a una persona cuando los camiones están en un lugar y le quitan la visibilidad a los choferes así es que today's eh, bills, packets of bills eh, besides addressing those particular items that we heard from the different council members from a specific area where the truck will deliver the good but also council member holding also bill for the first time eh, we will establish a fair system where the driver that we know the distance uh, that they have to keep when they park the vehicle close to a fire drive. So uh, this is a great opportunity. This is not only about addressing delivery. This is not only about, you know, make, uh, putting a clear area where drivers should not be allowed to park close to the fire drive. But this is also about vision zero. When many of those trucks are uh, driving to some residential area, when many of those trucks are uh, responding to the order that we consumers make through Amazon and other, uh, we need to come out with a system where we should have centralized uh, in different area where those trucks should be bringing the food. So this also uh, improve uh, or bring solution to issue related to visibility that unfortunately those trucks create in our city. So this is also about vision zero. With that, uh, I will now have our moderator and committee council call on the administration to testify and administer the order. Thank you, Chair. Uh, we have also been joined by Council Member Miller. Um, I'll now call on the following panelists to testify. Commissioner Gutman, uh, Commissioner LaRocca, uh, Deputy Commissioner Beaton, and Assistant Commissioner Zach. I will read the affirmation and then call on each individual to confirm their response aloud for the record. Please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee, and to respond honestly to council member questions? Uh, Commissioner Gutman? I do. Commissioner LaRocca? Yes. Uh, Deputy Commissioner Beaton? I do. Assistant Commissioner Zach? Yes. Thank you. You may begin your testimony when ready. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can you, can you hear me okay? Okay. Uh, good morning, Chair Rodriguez and members of the Transportation Committee. I'm Hank Gutman. I'm the Commissioner of the New York City Department of Transportation, 
With me today are Eric Beaton, our Deputy Commissioner for Transportation Planning and Management, and Rebecca Zack, Assistant Commissioner for Intergovernmental and Community Affairs. It's an honor to be testifying today along with uh, Commissioner LaRocca from the Department of Buildings. And I wanna thank you for the opportunity to testify on behalf of Mayor Bill de Blasio on the administration's freight vision and this package of freight and delivery bills, as well as intro 1811, sponsored by council member powers, which would create a pedestrian safety zone in the theater district in Manhattan, and intro 1819, sponsored by council member Holden, regarding fire hydrant street markings. As will be evident in the next few minutes, uh, the administration views this as an incredibly important issue for the future of our city. In recent decades, New York City has experienced record growth in terms of population, jobs, and commerce. Our complex freight network, with trucks currently delivering 90% of our goods, has played a critical role in this growth. The combined effects of the growth of e-commerce and the impact of the pandemic have dramatically increased freight volumes, not only between businesses as in the past, but to our residences as well. The New York Metropolitan Transportation Council or NIMTEC projects that by 2045, our city will move 68% more freight on an already constrained transportation network. More and larger trucks are emphatically not the answer. Let me repeat, more and larger trucks are not the answer. We need to bring about a transformative shift in the way freight moves through our city to reduce our dependence upon large trucks to deliver our freight, particularly in what's referred to as the last mile which in New York City, as we know, may actually be the last five or 10 miles. Just as the administration is reimagining how people move through our city by expanding bike and bus and e-mobility options to reduce our dependence on the privately owned automobile, so too we must reimagine how goods move as well, creating safe, attractive, and environmentally friendly alternatives to the large trucks that pollute our air, stress our aging roads and bridges, and harm the quality of life in our residential neighborhoods. The plans we make today will help determine the future of our city. We can and must find alternative ways to move goods that reduce the negative environmental, traffic, infrastructure, and safety effects on our city and its neighborhoods particularly on low-income communities and communities of color. New and creative solutions are needed, along with the renewed use of some old solutions, such as the waterways that were our original highways around which our city was built. They are why we are in this particular location. We should leverage our access to water and rail and find more ways to bring goods into the city through our ports and terminals, following the lead of global cities such as Paris and Rotterdam and US cities like LA and Long Beach, Boston, Chicago, Charleston, Savannah, Norfolk, and Oakland. If they can do it, we can. But despite a shift toward maritime and rail transportation, trucks and other commercial vehicles including cargo bikes, will still be needed to make the last mile deliveries. As long as trucks travel our streets and through our communities, we need to reduce their size and weight, shorten their trips, ensure that they are not violating the rules related to truck size and dedicated truck routes, convert them to clean fuel vehicles and make them safer. To reduce our reliance on diesel trucks, we need to shift to alternative modes of moving goods using a hub and spoke model of distribution centers where deliveries are handled by electric cargo bikes and smaller environmentally friendly vehicles, especially 
in our most dense urban centers. The private sector is already moving in this direction on their own because it makes business sense. The city can and must help facilitate and accelerate this trend. And we also need targeted enforcement to foster a culture of compliance to protect both our infrastructure and our neighborhoods. To enforce overweight, overdimensional, and off route vehicles that damage our streets and bridges and harm our communities, we must expand, explore and expand automated forms of enforcement and revise our antiquated permitting system and fees. Legislation sponsored by Senator Kavanaugh and Assemblymember Simon would authorize a program to use automated enforcement to protect the BQE, where way in motion sensors have determined that some trucks traveling on the structure weigh as much as 170,000 pounds, more than double the federal legal limits. And let me put this in context. When that structure was built, the largest trucks that it was built to accommodate weighed 70,000 pounds. Today, the federal legal limit is 80,000 pounds. And when we installed some WIM sensors, weigh in motion sensors, we discovered that there are trucks on that road over 100,000 pounds heavier than it was designed ever to accommodate. And this is not unique to the BQE. This is a citywide problem. This is not only a high, or as I said, this is not the only highway on which weight and size limits are ignored. And many of our streets in residential neighborhoods are also plagued by oversized trucks that don't legally belong there. Over the past several years, the DOT has engaged with industry stakeholders and government partners as it developed its smart truck management plan which lays the groundwork for policies that will accelerate the adoption of zero emissions urban freight technologies and innovations that improve the sustainability and resilience of the last mile delivery network. We also identify opportunities and strategies to build on the freight initiatives found in the one NYC plan, the DOT's own strategic plan, the EDC's freight NYC plan, and New York State's freight transportation plan. I'm pleased to say that the DOT received funding in the April plan to support this critical work. And for that, we are grateful. And fortunately, uh, the DOT is also undertaking a number of these initiatives with our partners in and out of government to transform the way freight moves through our city. First, the agency continues to designate parking spaces for loading or unloading commercial vehicles. Launched in 2019, our neighborhood loading zone program responds to the shift to residential deliveries and helps to reduce double parking to keep bus and bike lanes clear by providing space for active loading or unloading of personal for hire or commercial vehicles. With 111 neighborhood loading zones citywide already, uh, 49 of which the DOT added during the pandemic, our first year evaluation of the program has demonstrated its success. In the first year, overall double parking on corridors within these zones decreased by a range of between 10 and 70%, and corridors with the highest zone use averaged 600 vehicles per space each month for about 26 minutes at a given time. We also found that zone effectiveness and utilization is dependent on the length of the zone, the placement along a block, parking enforcement, and the local demand characteristics, all of which will inform our strategy as we expand the program citywide. In addition, all street improvement programs, projects rather, in metered areas undergo a thorough curb evaluation that often includes the installation of additional commercial parking spaces. Finally, the agency adds commercial spaces based on requests from businesses, many of which are in non-metered areas. Second, through our commercial cargo bike pilot program, the DOT incentivizes adoption of sustainable and efficient freight delivery by making designated loading and unloading space available for cargo bikes on street. 
cargo bikes and the pilot can load and unload wherever commercial vehicles can and are exempt from any muting beater payment. In addition, the DOT installed two cargo bike corrals to date for businesses that need on street space to facilitate their operations with more such spaces planned for 2021. Companies participating in the program share cargo bike trip GPS data with us. Based on an analysis of this data, the number of cargo bike deliveries increased by 109% between May of 2020 and January of 2021. In January 2021 alone, there were over 45,000 cargo bike deliveries, and there were no traffic crashes uh, involving those bikes that have been recorded since the start of the pilot. Based on this success, the DOT plans to promulgate rules to make the program permanent and larger. Now, state law enacted last year restricts e-bike e width to three feet. Unfortunately, that prohibits the use of many of the off-the-shelf cargo bike models, making the adoption and expansion of our program difficult for those who want to use it. As called for in the council's resolution, the administration supports the passage of Senator Ramos and Assemblymember Jackson's bill to increase those width limitations to allow cargo bike designs that are more efficient, ergonomic, and, more red and most importantly, more readily available in the marketplace. This will allow our program to continue growing and make it easier for companies to leverage sustainable micromobility for the last mile delivery. Third, the city also supports off-hour deliveries through the DOT's off-hour deliveries program, which Mayor de Blasio launched in April 2019 as part of a comprehensive program to reduce congestion, improve bus transit speeds, and decrease the opportunity for conflicts with pedestrians and cyclists. The program encourages goods delivery during off-peak hours of 7 p.m. to 6 a.m. to decrease congestion and truck emissions with the goal of reaching 1,500 business locations by the end of 2021, specifically in Midtown Manhattan, Lower Manhattan, Downtown Brooklyn, Flushing, and Jamaica, where there are high pedestrian volumes and limited curb space. With participation at over 900 business locations citywide, we continue to expand the program despite the pandemic related challenges those businesses have faced. And the mayor has instructed us to look for ways to dramatically expand and increase this program. Fourth, the city's truck route network, which was established in the 1970s and most recently revised in 2015 and 2018, requires updating to reflect the changes in residential and commercial land use patterns, the transportation networks, and the delivery patterns from e-commerce. The administration supports changes to add connectivity to, from, and within industrial business zones and to fill in gaps, adding new designations where needed and remove certain routes, routes as well. Um, the success of the network will depend upon trucks adhering to the designated routes. Fifth, the New York City Clean Truck Program, which builds on the successful Hunts Point Clean Truck Program, which replaced over 500 South Bronx trucks and required safety elements such as side guards. In June 2020, DOT announced the expansion of the New York City Clean Truck Program, a rebate incentive program to accelerate the deployment of cleaner trucks in industrial business zones located near environmental justice communities that have historically been subject to a disproportionate amount of diesel exhaust emissions. The program will invest $9.8 million to replace older, dirtier, dirtier diesel powered trucks with advanced transportation technologies and alternative fuels trucks, including electric trucks. Again, we want to expand and increase this program. Sixth, emerging curb management technologies are allowing us to better manage and regulate the curb. The city's transition to plate-based technologies, such as mobile payment and the upcoming launch of pay by plate and virtual permitting 
offer tools to keep pace with the changing needs of our streets. And finally, the coming implementation of the Central Business District Tolling Program, the nation's first congestion pricing program, represents a transformational opportunity to increase freight efficiency. DOT is working closely with the MTA, which is responsible for implementing and operating the system, and will participate in evaluating the system with the objectives that I've mentioned in mind. Now, turning to the bills before the committee today. Introduction to 2279 by Council Member Reynoso on installing more commercial loading zones. The administration strongly supports the expansion of commercial loading zones to help mitigate the challenges of, of accessing curb space in the city's high density areas. We are actively expanding these zones and often install new zones together with other changes as part of our ongoing and larger street improvement projects. We're always looking for places in, to do more, but we don't believe that implementing more loading zones according to blanket formulas is the right approach. And in some instances, it could be counterproductive. Um, our team analyzed the geographic parameters in the bill and found that this would cover large areas across the Bronx, Brooklyn, Manhattan, and Queens, where there's currently little or no commercial loading. Complying with the bill as drafted would require substantial repurposing of existing private passenger vehicle parking in many of these neighborhoods. While this can be helpful in the right location, uh, the DOT has been actively adding loading zones in both residential and commercial age uh, areas. This specific 25% requirement may require new zones in areas where they're not actually needed and miss areas where they are. So while we agree strongly with the objective of the legislation, uh, we don't believe it'll accomplish that objective efficiently at least as currently drafted. So what we would welcome is a dialogue with the council and with the council member about goals for implementing more loading zones di across different areas of the city. We agree with the objective, we just have some questions about the details of implementation. Uh, introduction 2277, uh, introduced by council member Powers, which contains several provisions on the management of commercial loading zones. Again, while we strongly support the goal of enhancing the management and performance of these zones, the administration would like to work with the council on revising the bill to achieve this goal. Uh, the bill would require all loading zones to have muni meters, um, requiring the installation of this costly hardware on, on the relevant streets could have the unintended consequence of slowing the deployment of loading zones or even preventing them entirely when the budget's constrained rather than require a specific, specific means of capturing payments and managing time, we would suggest that the department have the flexibility to use either such meters or a mobile payment system, a reservation system, or a combination of these in managing loading zones. Again, the, tech, uh, the technology is moving and we're trying to move with it. So being tied to the meters might end up being counterproductive and that's our concern. The bill would also extend the hours a commercial vehicle can park if parking is metered from three hours to eight hours. Similarly, we would suggest that the department have the flexibility to use shorter and longer durations depending on the, leads, the needs of the local land uses rather than being locked into an eight hour standard as different communities we found have different needs. The bill also includes a requirement for DOT to include stipulations to require alternative loading zones when use of the street for a construction project ob obstructs a loading zone. Uh, there are thousands of such permits each year. Uh, while designating alternative temporary loading zones during construction may be necessary in some cases, uh, it can be very challenging and labor intensive. Uh, we also contend with high residential density competing involving and evolving land uses throughout the city's central business district and overall limitations to sidewalk space. So again, we, we, we agree with the concept, but having it automatic in every instance where there's a construction permit, we think could in some instances be counterproductive, um, particularly as we face the ever increasing demand uh, for our sidewalk and street space. 
Uh, so again, this is this is an example where we'd like to work with the council and with the council member uh, to suggest some proposed modifications of the legislation. On intro 2282, sponsored by the chair, which would require a truck route redesign. As I discussed earlier, the, the administration supports making revisions on our truck routes. Um, uh, and we are in the process of doing it and we'll have something to say shortly. Uh, I should note though, that there are a, a few responses to the legislation as drafted. The bill would mandate initial and final reports on proposed changes with public comment requirements. Our current process for making changes to the truck route network, however, already has its own hearing and public comment process as required by the City Administrative Procedure Act, known as CAPA. So while we value public input, we should ensure that the legislation doesn't create a duplicative process to the one that we're already gonna be following. Uh, the bill would also, so again, this is something we would be happy to discuss uh, with the chair and, and with the council. Uh, the bill would also require DOT to implement daylighting at each intersection adjacent to the truck route network. Uh, daylighting is an important tool in our toolbox uh, and we favor using it in the situations where it can make a difference um, because safety is our top priority. Um, but we would respectfully suggest that this isn't a one size fits all solution uh, we found it incredibly valuable in some places, but in others not really valuable or necessary. Uh, so we would hope that the legislation could be revised to provide the DOT discretion to determine where its use actually would, would further the goal that we all share of safety. Introduction 2253 by the speaker, micro distribution centers are the future. I think I tried to make that clear in my testimony. And this administration strongly supports encouraging their adoption. When paired with environmentally friendly vehicles, these hubs have the potential to increase efficiency and decrease negative effects on the environment and local communities by reducing traffic and delivery vehicle dwell time in high demand, high density areas with limited curb space. Many have already begun popping up throughout the city but we want to ensure that companies both big and small have access to this type of facility. We look forward to working with the council and dis discussing possibilities for a pilot program and how best the city can promote micro distribution, including by partnering with and catalyzing the public sector, which as I mentioned is already moving in this direction. And as I mentioned earlier, amending state legislation to allow wider cargo bike models is crucial to supporting private sector adoption. Introduction 2281, sponsored by Council Member Rivera, which would require the DOT to create an office, the DOB rather, to create an office of sustainable delivery systems and require large commercial buildings to implement delivery and servicing plans. Servicing, service and delivery, again, we, we agree completely with the objective of the legislation. Service and delivery plans are a promising practice to enhance sustainability and reduce congestion. Uh, and we welcome conversations with the council member and with the council about how the city can best encourage these plans, building on the city's experience with large buildings through the carbon challenge. I defer to our, our sister agencies about implementation challenges for the bill, uh, and in particular to our colleagues at the Department of Buildings. But as to the objective, we are, we are entirely with you. Introduction 1811, sponsor, sponsored by council member Powers, which would geographically expand designated activity zones or DAZs and pedestrian flow zones that DOT implemented and maintains in Times Square. We're proud of the work that we've already done along with our partner agencies and stakeholders to craft innovative responses to pedestrian congestion in this one of a kind location. However, the DAZs and flow zones we implemented are possible because of the amount of pedestrian plaza space at this specific site. We believe that expanding the approach to general sidewalks outside of this unique location, as the bill calls for on several additional blocks, presents some feasibility challenges. Uh, in addition, our colleagues in the administration have some other concerns, which again, we look forward to discussing 
with the council. Um, we're, we're happy to engage in that dialogue. Finally, uh, intro 1819, which would require the DOT to mark the location of each fire hydrant using a symbol painted in the middle of the street directly across from the hydrant. Uh, we defer to our colleagues at the FDNY on the emergency response benefits of the proposal. Uh, I would point out that for DOT installing and maintaining such markings would require very significant resources. Uh, but if our, if our uh, fire department colleagues uh, believe that this would make a meaningful difference and we can find the resources to get it done, obviously we are all in favor of its safety objectives. Finally, in conclusion, I would like to thank the council for the opportunity to testify today. The, the challenge before us is great. We must meet the projected increased freight activity over the next several decades while working toward a safer, more responsible, sustainable, efficient freight system that grows the economy, supports freight related jobs, delivers the goods that residents and businesses need and delivers environmental justice as well. Today, I've highlighted just some of the aspects of our agency's vision and a few promises strategies we plan to pursue. We look forward to working with the council on these strategies and further discussing these pieces of legislation. We welcome your questions after you hear from our colleagues at DOB. And again, let me emphasize, we look forward to working with the council to achieve what I believe are our common objectives in this field. Thank you. Good morning, Chair Rodriguez and members of the Committee on Transportation. I'm Melanie LaRocca, Commissioner of the New York City Department of Buildings. I'm pleased to be here to discuss two of the bills before the committee regarding making deliveries more sustainable. The department is hard at work at implementing the Historic Climate Mobilization Act, which regulates greenhouse gas emissions from large buildings greater than 25,000 gross square feet starting in 2024. Last year, these large buildings were also required to start posting energy grades at their buildings, which ensures that uh, owners are held accountable for their performance and make uh, their energy transparency, uh, energy efficiencies, pardon me, transparent to the public. We are very much aligned with the city council on the issue of reducing carbon emissions. And it is clear that large buildings have a critical role to play. Intro 2281 creates an Office of Sustainable Delivery Systems, which is tasked with making deliveries to and from buildings greater than 500,000 gross square feet more sustainable. One of the primary responsibilities of this new office would be to provide guidance to owners on the development of delivery and service plans and to oversee the implementation of such plans. While the department is certainly committed to sustainability, we do not have any expertise in making deliveries more efficient and sustainable, particularly where regulating vehicle movement is involved. However, like our colleagues at the Department of Transportation, we are certainly committed to working with the city council to further our shared sustainability goals. And we look forward to discussing this bill further to determine if there are any areas where the department can contribute our expertise. Intro 2280 requires secure package storage areas in certain new and existing residential buildings. We understand the need for efficient package management and are aware that certain buildings have already started to include space for package storage in their designs. As such, the department supports this bill as it relates to new buildings and looks forward to working with the city council to address key details including how much space for package storage should be provided within a building. With respect to existing buildings, this proposal merits further discussion with existing property owners to fully understand the challenges that may present uh, for them and to ensure that there are no unintended consequences, including requiring significant alterations to an existing building where minor construction work is being performed elsewhere in the building. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify before you, and I would welcome any questions you may have.
So I think that uh, from the administration, right, we already have both commissions, uh, two great individuals that I have the honor to be working close in the Department of Transportation, Department of Building. There's nobody else from the administration. Since they looked at this now, so let's start the section of getting to the question. I have a few questions and then I know that my colleagues has other questions. Uh, Commissioner Han, uh, can you elaborate a little bit more on which are the problems that exist today regarding the distribution of good throughout the city, uh, including things such as increased congestion, lack of infrastructures, for effective distribution or in others. Sure. Uh, <clears throat> uh, thank you, thank you, Chair Rodriguez, and it's it's good to see you. Good to see it's you good again. Good. Nice to see uh, you. And thank uh, you for being in Washington tonight too. Oh, that I mean, was that was that was that was a great event. I was very happy and honored to be there. Um, thank you. Uh, so, so uh, the challenge. The challenge is, is helping facilitate the transition, the transformation from reliance on large diesel trucks to deliver goods within the city itself to instead using smaller, environmentally friendly vehicles that don't cause the same congestion, that don't cause the same pollution, that can more easily use the limited space at the curb. Um, I mean, that is the huge that are that are environmentally friendly. You know, electric if electric if possible. Um, these are these are all the challenges we face, and the fact that the freight needs and demands of the city have grown so dramatically in recent years, and and show every indication of continuing to grow, and that the places being delivered to are no longer just commercial establishments or industrial sites, but it's now everybody's home. Um, all of this has created an enormous stress on the system. And so we need to have a multimodal approach to dealing with that. Everything from making better use of rail and our waterways to, to helping facilitate the transition from large trucks to small environmentally vehicles, environmentally friendly vehicles, including those cargo bikes. So we've outlined a series of steps that we've taken. Many of them began as pilots in the last year or two. Um, all of them uh, have shown successful results so far. And so what we're trying to do is come up with the strategies to provide both incentives for people to do more of them, disincentives to continuing in the old ways, uh, so that all of us can make that transition together because it's, it's increasingly clear that this is essential for the future of, of the city and how, how goods move, how things move. It's not just, so far we've been focusing mainly on how people move. We have to apply the same degree of attention and effort to how goods move, because both are essential to our future. And again, I in, in preparing for today's testimony, I was thrilled to see that the objective of, of all the legislation that's proposed and under discussion today is all moving in the same direction that we are. I mean, there's some differences on the details and sometimes the devil's in the details, but all of us are trying to effect, effectively bring about that kind of transition. And that I think is, is a great sign of hope for progress. I agree with you. And I think that even though, as you say, the devil is on the detail, but I feel that uh, even with some detail that we need to look at it, there's not many devils. I think that overall, I think we agree with most of the things. This is about the execution and the plan that we need to follow because at the end of the day, we are all responsible. You know, regardless of the role that we play in our life today, and the role that people play in the future. I think this is all about how to address issues related to sustainability, how to address issues about the new culture that we have to build around a street. The street doesn't belong to the truck car owner. The street belongs to everyone 
And when we had 8.6 million New Yorkers, only 1.4 million individuals, they have vehicle. It means that more than 7 million New Yorkers, uh, the majority of the city, rely on public transportation. Mm -hmm. And I think that the part related to the demand that also uh, uh, we have created in our city. Even though people say we don't want Amazon in Queens, but because of the comfort, most people, even those who were organizing against it, they gave most of the product ordered to Amazon. Yeah. So I feel that, uh, and again, uh, all my support to anyone who dedicated mm -hmm. to organize. So I think that we all play a different role. But who who is is DOT the agency leading the coordination and conversation around this particular issue? Uh, of course, I will assume that at some point other agency also interact from DCAS uh, that you know lead the trucking or the city the city vehicle uh, to I I will assume that the uh, uh, EDC. SBA because at some point also, you know, how do we get those big corporations to deliver a certain hours? How do we create those incentives? At the end of the day, it's about the dollars. Uh, uh, from their point of view, for a point of view to make them more responsible uh, and, and to know that it is the residents of our city, the one who are our priority when we do any policy. So assuming that DOT, right, is the one that coordinates that uh, bringing it with other agency. Have any conversation also been happening led by DOT around bring, bringing economic incentive to those private sectors that made some changes on operation and how to organize the new way to deliver it good to consumers? Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm glad you asked uh, that question, Chair Rodriguez, because um, yes, we are, uh, we we are in the process of organizing exactly that kind of interagency uh, task force group. Doesn't have a formal name yet, but but one of the challenges has been that there are various agencies in the city that have some responsibility for the issues that touch on this problem, and since much of it falls within the jurisdiction of the DOT. One thing that we've been working on is finding our counterparts at EDC, which you mentioned, DCAS, et cetera, uh, the sustainability office. Uh, and we have engaged all of them in dialogue on this. And we are working to make sure that our various plans and approaches work together seamlessly, that it's not a bunch of agencies acting independently and without coordination or concern for what each other's doing. I mean, it's one city, it's one city administration. Uh, we all have an obligation, as you point out, a duty. We're, you know, it's an honor to be able to serve the people of the city of New York. And one thing that we are working very hard on is making sure that all of these agencies act in a coordinated fashion. For example, EDC, uh, developed a couple of years ago a, a freight plan, which is very innovative, making use of rail and the water and the waterways, et cetera. And they've been busy pursuing it. So one thing we've been working on with the EDC is making sure that what they're doing coordinates with what, what, what we're doing. I mean, we, we seem to have more responsibility for the last mile. They've got more responsibility for how goods get here in the first place and get from here since we also produce things in New York. Um, so getting those two things put together. Uh, and then the Port Authority is also an important partner and EDC had been working with Port Authority on some of the broader issues. So what we're trying to do is to get everybody working together on a single consolidated approach. Um, so the support and assistance of the council on that is obviously welcome, but, but you've, you've asked exactly the same question uh, mm -hmm. that we're focusing on. So thank you. And I, and I think that this is with the direction of the city because I heard both Brooklyn Board President Eric Adams as also addressing the, the need on how all the agencies should be connecting and improving the coordination and following some model already is happening in Boston. So I don't know if this is something also that you got from DOT 
are looking at it, but when I look at, listen to Adams and say how we need to coordinate and have one platform where everyone from the residents of those communities uh, to those who use the truck company and request any permit. So this business owner, they everyone should know where, how we are moving, any details or any application or any posting or any uh, projects going on. And, and in that, and is there one of more, I don't know if you have any answer, yes, but for me, it's also a, a common question is that I feel that I do, as you know, in my bill, we want to create a center a set to centralize the area where all those, uh, the FedEx, the UPS, everyone, Amazon, they create, create a area where they bring all those goods there and from there, they deliver it to the consumers by using bicycle, using all the motor transportation, something that I'm proud to see DOT working in pilot projects in the past. But I also feel that it's important to connect that process with local small businesses. Uh, I think that we need to encourage and the other tools that we have to negotiate and, and with those big corporations is, you know, a incentive. But I think that what we have seen is a map and pop store being closing every day because they cannot compete with the type of Amazon or other one. So at some point, as you will be working with those, especially ADC, what incentive can be put in place for those large corporations also work with a small uh, clothing store in yep. a local community, with a restaurant, with, with a multi-service company so that they also become satellite. I think at this point, also consumers, we need to step up a little bit for our comfort, expecting that everything must be going to our apartments. And as we demand for everything going to our apartments, it means that we are demanding for more trucks and therefore we are also contributing to climate change. Yep. So I, I, bringing everyone you know, on board, making everyone to do more, uh, be more responsible. Uh, I just hope again that you will put together I'll see it together with City Hall, that task force that also so aspect related to making those, working with those big corporations so that they work with a map and pop store that most likely be, can be closing because they cannot afford the competition, how they can also involve, include them in that process on the new New York City where everyone should be able to make a living. Good return to the big corporation a good and supporting the map and pop small business to survive, who create most of the job, and at the same time, the consumers to get what they want by understanding that they cannot continue with the comfortable of everything has to be in front of my door. So do you see any possibility on, on creating a new aspect where also, you know, the big corporation, the UPS, the Amazon, the FedEx also can be working and we saw a small map and pop store, and instead of delivering directly to the apartment of the consumers, bring some of those goods to those local small store and everyone being able to make a good profit. Sure, well, I, I, I think that the hope, the hope is that as part of our recovery, which we're, which we're in the early days of, but we're hoping is going to proceed uh, you know, quickly and and completely that that people will want to get out to the stores more and will will might feel a hunger to get out and return to those patterns but you know even those stores rely on delivery for their inventory etc they get the goods that they sell so so yes that's clearly an important part of the chain the other thing which i think you touched on, uh, Chair Rodriguez, which is part of what we're trying to accomplish, is, is to make sure that, that this business model, this delivery model, isn't just available to the big guys. I mean, they've adopted it on their own because they've figured out it works. Um, so they did that pilot program for us, in a sense. What we're, what we're working on coming up with is models that would allow us to create uh, 
the same opportunities for smaller delivery folks, for the people who, you know, who are more local, et cetera. So I think that that addresses part of what you were asking about. Um, and that's where I think there can be a real role for, for city government in terms of helping, up, helping set up, you know, Amazon or, or, or UPS may create a, create a massive facility in which to do this stuff, but creating smaller places where local entities can perform the same kind of efficiency, enjoy the same efficiencies um, and perform the same kind of transition is something that is definitely on our list of items we're pursuing, so. Okay, okay I have just one more question and then I'm, I'm gonna be calling my colleague. Uh, uh, what, what, are, uh, what does the city, uh, what does the city currently are doing in, in regard to ensuring that there is enough vehicle charging infrastructure without the, without the city? Uh, that, that is another item on our to-do list. Um, we've got a pilot program now uh, for electric, electric vehicle charging, and it is on the list of projects that we're looking to accelerate. Uh, um, there, I mean, there are uh, uh, electric chargers being put in city garages now as we speak. We are exploring opportunities to expand that program, and I don't have anything to announce today, but that is something we're actively working on. Thank you, Commissioner. And now let, let's go now to the colleagues who have question. I bring it back to Elio so that I'm gonna be calling. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, first, we have been joined by council members Menchaca and Levin. Um, we'll now call on council members for questions in the order they use the Zoom raise hand function. Uh, council members, please keep your questions to five minutes. The sergeant will keep a timer and let you know when your time is up. Um, council member Holden will be first and council member Holden will be followed by council member Miller. Council member Holden. Starting time. Thank you. Thank you, chair. And thank you, commissioner Gutman. Um, regarding the truck deliveries that you spoke about and how freight moves through the city, um, we have 53 foot trailers are kind of the norm now. And I was always told they're illegal to operate on New York City streets uh, because, um, and then yet, yet everyone seems to be looking the other way regarding this. Uh, so when you have a 53 foot trailer, those are the extended trailers. Uh, and then you have an extended cab that the driver is in. Many times they sleep in, in part of it. Now you're looking at a vehicle that's well over 70 feet operating in New York on New York City's narrow streets. So, um, so especially, especially dangerous. Um, you know, they're especially dangerous on turns. And you mentioned in your in your testimony that many of the trucks are overweight and are and are damaging our infrastructure. I addressed this with the police department some years ago, as to why they're operating on New York City streets. They can only they need a special permit, as I understand it. Maybe you can enlighten me but they need a special permit to operate, even drive through our city, much less get off and then make deliveries. So as a result, you have these 53 foot trailers, extended cabs, when they go on their loading bays, they're blocking half the street and they're sticking out. They weren't, these loading bays weren't designed for these extended cabs, neither were our street corners. So drivers are also telling me that and they said this a number of times to me, that they're not even trained to operate these 53 foot trailers in New York City or anywhere, yet the companies are making them do it. And unfortunately, so they need a special, they need special training to operate it. They're, they don't have it, yet the companies are, to make more profits, are making the drivers do this. So we, get, we have this big problem in New York City because I've had in, on my street corner where I live in the residential, Car, these trucks are spilling off the expressway sometimes because they're lost. I don't know how they should be lost with GPS now, but they are. And they wind up on the narrow streets. I've had a don't walk sign, walk, don't walk sign, electronic sign that's been knocked down probably two dozen times within the last five years because the trucks can't make this turn and they get into a bottleneck and they cause havoc. So first of all, why are we allowing 53 foot trailers if they're illegal in New York City? And 
why are we not? And, and, I, and if I ask the police department why they can't enforce it, they said we don't have the resources. That means staffing. So what can be done to address this, uh, Commissioner? Let, let me, that's first things first here, you know, because what we have now is illegal. I, I couldn't, I couldn't agree more, council member. Uh, uh, my introduction to this issue was when I served on the mayor's BQE committee and we looked at, at that stretch of highway, the cantilever, and the fact that illegally heavy trucks and illegally large trucks were driving on that road and were contributing significantly to its, to its demise. And it's, well, why can't we enforce the law? And uh, I also share your concern about enforcing the law on the city streets themselves, because whatever damage oversized and overweight trucks do to our infrastructure on, on highways and bridges, uh, they also destroy quality of life, as you say, in our neighborhoods. When they get stuck trying to round a corner, um, you, the only thing you left out was pedestrians on the sidewalk. When they end up going up on the sidewalk as they try to make the turn. Um, so uh, I think what we need, so I, I would desperately like to enhance our enforcement capabilities in all those regards. Um, apart from getting more police resources devoted to this, um, the, the other options, I think, involve electronic enforcement. We have the technology with these WIM sensors to figure out the overweight and oversize issues. There are other technologies available, just as we use cameras to enforce speed and red light. There are other the cameras could be used to find the off-route trucks. And all of this requires uh, the consent of Albany. So this will require more legislation. We're waiting for the first piece to pass now in terms of the whim sensors that we've installed on some fragile pieces of infrastructure. But I think it's a problem. It's a problem citywide. I mean, the other issue is getting industry to pay attention. Um, I'm expired. Know, sorry. Uh, but I, I agree with you and whatever you can come up, you know, we, we, we are in favor of making the enforcement real. Uh, Chair, if I may, just one, one follow up to that quickly. Um, the police, um, I know they, if you talk to the, just the, uh, the precinct, I would say 90% of the, the officers I spoke to don't even know about this law. So we need to educate NYPD because like you mentioned, pedestrians are at risk when these car, these trucks are turning the way they're turning. The, but the city is losing millions of dollars a year on the infrastructure and our streets. And the fact that I'm telling you, as I've been working on this for 20 years and I keep getting the same answer. I think it's, it's they're putting profits over people's lives. The industry is, but I, I, I think the city is not doing their job uh, and the city could do their job, but I, I think they want to look the other way because it's the economic thing. But New York City streets were not designed for these massive 75 foot trucks making turns and it endangers everyone like pedestrians and certainly people have been killed by this. So we need to get tough with this. And if we're, if we're going to have a law, then we need to enforce it. So what's, what good is having laws if you, can, if you won't enforce them? We can. But now it used to be a few trucks here and there. They have a 53 foot marker on the truck. Some are erasing that now. And that's a, that's a violation. They have to have a stencil 53 foot on the side of the trailer. They don't, that's number one. And the fact that they're driving them, we should, we should crack down. And I would ask the mayor, and again, if, if you, DOT is serious, they'll put out an advisory and a crackdown and not just say, yeah, we'd like to do it, but you know, we don't see how we can do it. We, we can force the NYPD to do it. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councilmember Holden. Um, next, we will hear from Councilmember Miller, who will be followed by Councilmember Menchaca. Councilmember Miller. Starting time. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chair, for once again, your leadership on this issue. Uh, Commissioner Gutman, thank you for, for, for the tour. It, it was robust and it was comprehensive. 
uh, and um, I, 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 I guess that you witness the, the, the burdens that, that the constituency endure on a daily basis being in a, in, in a not just a transportation desert, but in a living in a community or in a city where, where all transportation patterns and design are, are pretty antiquated. And, you know, what, what do we do about that? Um, and, and I will say that uh, it, it, it went a long way and I'm, I am all often a apprehensive uh, about the motives, motives and motivations of, of DOT and uh, the lack of investment in transportation deserts, lack of investment in, in communities of color that oftentimes uh, the investment is punitive as in red light cameras and, and, and uh, speed cameras and not real infrastructure investment. And so I'm glad that we had the tour, we had a robust conversation about your vision and, and what can be done to address this and that we have a real advocate there. Um, those, which, which leads me to 2279, uh, as you see in the downtown area, we have a lot of development occurring uh, simultaneously down there um, uh, in the area that is the uh, busiest bus transportation hub in, in, in the city and, and nearly in America. And, and uh, but we have landed a number of uh, large developments there, uh, which require uh, loading docks and um, not sure how that is going to happen, even if it's just simple curb cuts. Uh, and um, so clearly we're going to have to address that problem in the very near future. Uh, the concern is the, the, the kind of uh, uh, discretion that DOT has in uh, deciding uh, that they're going to take 25 foot of curb space and allot it to uh, 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 these uh, buildings for, uh, de for deliveries. Uh, large deliveries outside of the, the normal um, uh, truck delivery uh, access and, and, and parking. Uh, so if, if, if you could kind of uh, calm my anxieties uh, about uh, DOT and its discretion and, 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 and the fact that when these projects occur that there will be public discourse and community engagement uh, around that and, and in particular community boards would be involved uh, before any such implementation would occur. Sure. Uh, the, the, first of all, let me say, let me thank you for, for hosting us in your district. Uh, I guess it was last Friday. Yeah. Uh, uh, I very much enjoyed the opportunity to see the streets we'd been discussing uh, personally and to, to have a firsthand uh, understanding of the issues you'd been raising with the agency, and and I too thought it was very productive and and certainly very informative. Um, uh, as to the as to the the commercial loading zones, again, this is this is an issue. Uh, this is an issue where where our our objective is to work closely with with the community, with your office. Uh, uh, and and to make sure that we're doing what makes sense, um, this is, you know, in areas where we have the ability to to do it. But but we, and recognizing the competing uses of the curb. I mean, we were out there looking at buses, right? Yeah. So so how how you, I mean, this is something we discussed, I guess, the other day. You've got the streets aren't getting any bigger, but we're. We're dedicating portions of them to bus use, portions of them to bikes, et cetera, et cetera, and it mm -hmm. and the commercial loading space has to fit in there too. So, so we're happy to work with you. And again, this is an example of an area where where the need for commercial loading space is sort of obvious. And and you know, if we didn't notice it, you would certainly bring it. You and your staff would certainly bring it to our attention, um, um, which which we thought probably works better than the more formulaic automatic based on census, et cetera, approach that was in the legislation. But, um, 
certainly we're we're looking for areas like that where we can make a difference. As to the process and who gets consulted, I'm, how, uh, I'm sorry. Oop. Okay, I was going to turn it to uh, the assistant commissioner, but again, if you know how to reach us, we can we can have that conversation offline. You, um, you can take time to finish that. Okay, I was I was I was going to toss it to assist. Assistant Commissioner Zach on the question of who's involved in the decision making process beyond the informal availability of our office to talk to your office and the borough commissioner to talk with your office. Yeah, at any point. The ABC is pretty unique and it's happening now. So um, yeah. I think any work that's going to get done is going to precede the implementation of this legislation here. So, how, how, how do we make sure that we get that right? Right. I mean, Rebecca. Yeah, I, I, I'll circle back with the team here and talk to the Queen's office and Eric and some of his staff and, and put together the, the, right, the right folks to talk to you. Happy to follow up. I'll reach out to Ali too. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Multiple locations that, that are like happening right now. Understood. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Uh, next, we'll hear from Council Member Minchaka. Council Member Minchaka. Starting time. Thank you, uh, Commissioner. I don't think we've we've spoken yet, and so congratulations on your you. appointment. And uh, looking forward to working with you. Uh, I know our, uh, Deputy Commissioner Zach and and uh, uh, Commissioner La Roca too over at uh, DOT are are very uh, briefed on what I'm about to ask. And really, I want to I want to bring this conversation into focus in Red Hook. Red Hook, which has five last mile delivery distribution centers on their way, uh, totaling 3 million square feet of engaged work in this. Uh, and we've been talking about it for the last hour and some, and it's causing real fear. And we have been talking about this for two years. And so we're, we're kind of, we're, we're not where you are. I think you're still trying to understand it. We're, we're done with that in Red Hook. We have some ideas. And we're we're faced with this the 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 issue that happens in city government that basically because there's 15 different agencies that have to look at something nothing happens and so we're we're really we're we're kind of done with that grace where the community is done with us at the city level with that grace period of get your shit together and they're pissed and so what I would like to talk to you about is either getting you physically to Red Hook to understand what's happening on the ground one. Two, work with the agencies, and we're talking about EDC because EDC has a lot of managed property on top of Port Authority uh, with a lot of uh, capital improvements coming to the ferries and home port too. There's a lot of infrastructure that's going to get, uh, in a lot of ways, impacted by, it, by all these last mile delivery, not, not, to, not including the schools that are in the neighborhood. So, like, you know the issue. I, I, I have been listening to you. you. You got the issue. What we are faced with, with is the inaction of the city is gonna cause the fears to come to fruition. And we're gonna be in a bad place because people are gonna die on the streets of New York in Red Hook, Red Hook by truck and the pollution is gonna be real and we're just not moving fast enough. So I'm here just to sound the alarm in a very public way to you. I'm very frustrated with the fact that the, just the agencies are not moving in any real way or, or talking to each other. And, and so here we are. And, and so this is more of a comment and I'd love to work with you, but at this point, I, I just I haven't seen any real movement on anything, just a lot of talking. And so um, I'll invite you to come to Red Hook to check it out. But um, we have some real ideas on how to think about traffic flow. Um, we also have some ideas to curb the actual construction of more last mile delivery. I think we have reached a oversaturation, which brings in the subsidy planning. Uh, and if city planning isn't talking to EDC, isn't talking to DOT, isn't talking to DOB, then, then the market, and, and, and I heard you say this earlier, I think this is a really big point, that, that this is just how goods are going to happen. This is how goods are going to move. That's a market force. The city has a responsibility to its community to shape the market forces, and the market forces are winning right now. And if all of those last mile delivery uh, centers are in full throttle, we're not going to be able to move anything. Uh, and I think that the last mile delivery folks are beginning to understand that too, but that's where leadership comes. And I just haven't seen that. Um, so 
will you come to Red Hook? Of course. So, so first of all, um, uh, council member, it's it's a treat to see you, um, uh, even even on Zoom again, <laughs> again, and and I look forward to working with you in, I guess, your ongoing capacity, my new capacity, um, we, and I'd be delighted to come to Red Hook and and look around uh, and I mean, see whatever it is you'd like me to see. Uh, um, if it's any comfort, I've already, I've already had conversations with some of your colleagues in government um, who also are responsible for that jurisdiction about some of these issues. And they've even started introducing me to some of the community groups. So, so we are, again, we're not, as, we're not quite as clueless as you may have feared. Uh, but we obviously still have a lot to learn, and and we are most anxious because precisely because this kind of distribution model um, is, I think, critical to getting rid of the big trucks. Uh, certainly within the city, uh, you know, we we would like to encourage it, but we also want it to be responsible. Now, I think some of the projects there are as of right. So there's not a whole lot that we have the ability to All do. All of them. With. Okay, so we don't have a lot. We can't prevent them. But I'm what, expired. What I would like to do, and this is something that we're already discussing, and I would be delighted to discuss further with you and your staff, and to do it on site, is to find ways to make them be good neighbors. Um, if the idea is to eliminate the big trucks um, on our residential streets, you know, you have to pay attention to how they get to these distribution centers and make sure that that whatever they're doing uh, is is consistent with the quality of life in the residential parts of the district. And that's that's something where I think we may be able to be of assistance and where we would certainly love to try because that I think is critically important. Um, so again, happy, happy to have this dialogue. We should continue it uh, with less of an audience and uh, with others involved, including EDC, et cetera, because I do think there are things we can do to allow the model to go forward, which we don't have the ability to stop and wouldn't want to for the other reasons, but to do it in a way that's that's not destructive of the quality of life in your district or in anybody else's, because that's obviously not the not the objective. So thank you for well, the question. Yeah, let's let's set that up. Thank you, Commissioner, sure. as soon as possible. And we do believe that there's ways to stop them, actually, and we want to talk to you about those as well. But that's going to require a larger citywide um, understanding about how we can uh, really understand saturation in neighborhoods and um, and allow for everyone to be uh, productive, both as a neighbor, uh, someone a resident, and and a distribution center. And so um, we, we, let's explore those ideas as well. Thank you, Chair, for this extra time. And I look forward to working with you and, and the rest of City City Hall. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Minchaka. Uh, Chair, I believe Councilmember Holden would like to ask a follow-up question, if it's okay with you. Okay. Councilmember Wantelman. Starting time. Uh, yes, Commissioner, just one little follow-up on um, my legislation about the on 1819 about um, the stencil of the fire hydrant. Um, I might make some suggestions uh, because it does seem that DOT wastes manpower or staffing uh, based on the fact that, let's say daylighting, for instance, I have a lot of locations in my district where they put up daylighting, which is good, except they put up two no standing signs, you know, going in each direction. Like, on the, why, would, why would we need a, a sign on the corner, no standing, going one way and then um, just a few feet from it is another sign. So you probably have maybe 10 feet in between the signs or 15, whatever it is. And um, what, what we're seeing, oh, sorry, my camera's not on. Okay, there we go. <laughs> um, what we're seeing is a waste of staffing to put multiple signs, unnecessary signs. Yet um, you mentioned that it would require more staffing to put a stencil, just essentially paint. And a stencil could be painted within a matter of, I, I'd say minutes, but I'm not sure, you know, what, what's required. Do you think it's that much of a of a problem for DOT to put the stencil in the middle of the street? I think the I, I'm told, and obviously we will pursue this further, that there's 
there is an issue of uh, contracting capability. The people who do this painting on the street, that there aren't enough of them to do what we're called on. So it's not even DOT personnel apart from resources. And I think if it were just doing it in a few places, obviously that wouldn't be an issue, but I was handed a note that there are 110,000 uh, fire hydrants in the city of New York. So, I mean, if, if this is important, if, if, if our colleagues in the fire department believe that this is an important thing, we will obviously look to see if there are ways that, that it could be done or done in a phased manner. Well, but, I, but yeah. it's, you know, again, this is, this is, um, they're telling me it's not as easy as, as it sounds. Um, and, you know, we can, we can look at that, but it's, it's, yeah, I, uh, I don't think any commissioner, I don't think anybody's saying 110,000 at once, right? Um, like, you know, right, right away. All I'm saying is it could be phased in, it could be done in the districts that have more of a problem with, um, obviously hydrant parking. Where, where you have a right. very, very dense area and there might be a lot of fires in a particular area that has more density. So all, all I'm saying is this could be phased in over a period of years, but and it would make sense what, what, what Chair Rodriguez also said, it would make sense to extend this to not only the stencil, but to painting the 15 foot marker. So uh, right now people are guessing, they're, they're guessing what 15 feet away from the hydrant is. Uh, on each side. And as a result, there's people just sort of tend to do, do less, obviously, if they can try to fit or five feet or 10 feet. And I think we just need, need to just, you know, make it easier for people and also warn people that there's a hydrant there. Uh, and at the same time, helping the firefighters find, uh, if, if the firefighters are telling me there's a problem, there's a problem then. Yeah, they're the ones answering it. Yeah, I mean, council member, I certainly understand the concern. And what I can say is we will we will look at this further and um, figure out, figure out if there's an answer. I mean, I, I certainly understand the concern. All right. And this is done in, in other cities, by the way. It's not like we're not inventing this. Yeah, so, no, that's you know, no, I know. I, I realize this isn't this isn't the most innovative thing we've been talking yeah, but about. I do today. see, but Commissioner, I do see, and, and again, I, I know you, you just took over recently, but I do see that DOT tends to over sign areas. That means like the signage of putting up no standing. They put too many of them up many times where, you know, especially if you look at daylight and I have plenty of photographs to show the waste. So we need to maybe reallocate resources with the DOT to if, if we don't have enough street markers, then we need people to do that and take them off the sign uh, uh, detail. But thank you, thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Chair, for the second round. Sure. Thank you. And, and I definitely would, would like to be working with you, Council Member. This is important. I, as you know, I, Commissioners, you inherit, you know, the agencies. And I think that this is not about anything more than money for the city of New York. This is about, we, this is a source that we can raise money, can get a ticket. And, and I think again, that, and again, this is not yet on this administration. This is what we as a city have done. We, we, we collect $1 billion on ticket. And I think that anytime when, when we look at what new change will we make, it's about, okay, we will be losing five, 10, $20 million. So it doesn't make sense. I want any driver who, who violate a part of the law to get a ticket. But it is unfair that a driver doesn't know the distance that he or she must maintain. So I think that, you know, this is not about technology. This is about we cannot do it. This is about we cannot buy the paint. This is about we cannot put a signal. This is about we as a city using those tools to collect money. So again, uh, again, things that we've been doing for decades. Uh, and I feel that this is a time for us to, at least with this small, uh, uh, paint or putting the signal there, we need to let everyone know. Drivers should not park a, 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 on, on a 15 feet, but he or she should know when it's a distance because right now it's not. So with that, I want to thank you, my colleague. Uh, and again, everyone that, you know, have come from the administration, both commissioners, uh, uh, DOT, and I know that all question went to DOT, but I appreciate all the work that we've been doing together with our DOB commissioners. 
And with that, we let the administration go. And now we go to hear from Manhattan Borough President Gary Brewer and then members of the public. Thank you, Chair. Um, if there are no other council members that had questions, uh, we'll now turn to the Borough President and public testimony. I'd like to remind everyone that unlike our typical council hearings, we will be calling individuals one by one to testify. Uh, each panelist will be given two minutes to speak unless otherwise instructed by the chair. If your testimony is longer than the allotted time, you can please summarize and you may submit written testimony for the record by sending it to testimony at council.nyc.gov. Uh, council before, before we call on Manhattan Board President and usually some colleagues, they have to go to other meeting. I want to invite all my colleagues for the co-naming that we are having this coming Friday at noon at 166 and Broadway. The co-name is gonna be after Carlos Cook, a person that played an important role together with Michael X. So not only we're gonna be co-naming 166 and Broadway, a block away from what we co-name after Betty Shabab and Malcolm X, when Malcolm X was assassinated, but also on that day, this coming Friday at noon at that location, at the same time that we're gonna be doing the co-naming after Carlos Cook. And we're also gonna be calling for the reopening of the investigation uh, of the assassination of Malcolm X. And so everyone are invited uh, to come to Washington High, get a, a good rice and beans or mango. So with that, let's go now to Manhattan Moral President Gabriel. Well, thank you very much, Chair Rodriguez, for this and much other. It's always fun to hang out with you in your community. Um, I am Gail Brewer. I am the Manhattan Borough President, and I just want to congratulate you and DOT for the discussion today about how our city handles delivery of goods and services. And I have just three bills I'm going to uh, support. One is Speaker Johnson's Intro 2253, Council Member Reynoso's 2279, and uh, Council Member Bears 2281. Um, and they're all good bills. And the only suggestion I would have, and I know that you probably feel the same way, that these proposals need to be reviewed by community boards, because I know that community boards care about these issues, particularly about how food gets delivered. So uh, 2253, as you know better than I, would require DOT to pilot 12 micro distribution centers, transferring goods to sustainable modes of last mile delivery, um, and I think these would uh, function like uh, cargo, bike delivery corrals, currently installed at many Whole Foods, like one right near my house. And it aims to make deliveries to residents via bikes rather than trucks. And in our dead city, the last mile, if it's done in a space efficient vehicle, like a bicycle is very common sense. So I support that. It does help reduce, I hope, truck traffic. And that's something that we're all trying to do. I just wanna make sure that there is a place uh, that the cargo bikes can go um, in front of each center so that there isn't any uh, congestion sidewalk. 2279 would require DOT to designate commercial loading zones in 25% of certain census tracts. Um, you know, that the, these are proven to ensure that the deliveries happen in a timely manner, try to stop double parking. And this bill I think would help avoid these issues. The only suggestion I would have is to amend it so that it prescribes more varied street by street solutions and include the neighborhood loading zone language, the new DOT language. It has helped double parking be reduced in parts of Manhattan. And finally, 2281, it's an office of sustainable delivery systems and would require commercial buildings over 500,000 square feet to produce delivery plans to the department of buildings. Large commercial buildings, we know they generate truck traffic and it would require them to plan deliveries in ways that reduce that and make less disruption to neighbors. They would talk about delivery cons consolidation, off-peak deliveries, reservation systems. And with the DOB's newly formed delivery systems unit, which I didn't know about, but you do, um, this legislation would enable large buildings to receive de deliveries with less disrupt and the only suggestion I would have is I really, instead of that one office to talk about sustainable delivery systems, 
I'm hoping that down the line we can do an office of the public realm, which would include the bike lanes, the bus lanes, and things like this, but not a separate office for delivery systems. Thank you very much, uh, and I really appreciate this interactive discussion of, about how we can handle delivery of essential goods and services. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gail. We have been, you have been the best only colleague serving together the council, but the best also board president who have used your opportunity from your role to share the distribution of resources through equally through the whole a borough of Manhattan. And I know that transportation is on your heart. So definitely we will continue working together with you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Borough President Brewer. Um, next, we will turn to uh, other members of the public. Um, first, we will hear from Jose Hoglin Veras. Jose? Starting time. Sorry, Elio, and can you also explain the time? Yeah. And leave it for everyone, and please, if it would take more than that, you have summarized, like the 10 seconds before, we give you a, a let you know that you are getting close, but please keep it just for two, two minutes. And if you're test, if, please summarize your testimony, and if it goes over time, you can submit written testimony. Again, the address is testimony at council.nyc.gov. Okay. Jose? Fantastic. My name is Jose Holguin Veras. I want to thank Chair uh, Rodriguez and the council members for giving me the opportunity to be here. Uh, as I said, I am the director of the Center of Excellence for Sustainable Urban Freight Systems. That is a coalition of the leading freight research centers in the, in the world. We have a global view of urban freight management policy and planning, and among other accomplishments, our group was the, the group that designed the, of our delivery project that had been successfully implemented by the New York City Department of Transportation and, and the City of New York. Basically, I believe that this uh, package of uh, initiatives drafted by the City Council are basically important because it basically, in a unified way, they try to address the obstructions produced by double park trucks by meaning of trying to improve the commercial loading zones. The, uh, in addition, they try to foster the sustainable modes by means of uh, fostering uh, micro distribution centers and also requesting the, the New York State Legislature to remove the constraint to cargo bikes. In addition to that, I mean, I believe it's important to reduce the buff, the issue of package theft that has been affecting the New Yorkers because also in doing so, that helps increase delivery efficiency by making these uh, deliveries faster and minimizing the amount of time that trucks will be will spend at the curve. Uh, as I, as both the commissioner and several council members indicated, I mean there might be a need to uh, update the truck route systems. Is that also? In addition, and the, finally, I believe that the initiative of delivery as service plans is very important because it is an, an example of what we call demand management. In essence, I mean, large uh, developments have the responsibility to minimize- Time this. expired. Okay. And with that, basically, I want to uh, thank you for the opportunity to talk. Thank you for your testimony. Um, next, we will hear from, um, let's see. Uh, next, we have, um, Marco Connor Diacqua. Marco? Starting time. Yes, thank you. My name is Marco Connor Diacqua. I am Deputy Director of Transportation Alternatives. And I want to thank Council Speaker Corey Johnson, uh, Council Member Ivan Rodriguez, and today's bill sponsors for leading this critically needed set of bills. Um, the way that we currently use our street space is highly inequitable and it is harmful to every goal that this city has set around public health, our environmental and sustainability goals, reducing carbon emissions and reaching vision zero. And the trucks, uh, the way that we are using trucks uh, in, in package deliveries are lethal to New Yorkers and disproportionately account for the more than 1000 pedestrians and cyclists killed in just the past eight years. 
But right now we're using our limited street space in the most harmful way. 75% of our street space today is dedicated to moving or storing cars with the rest of us pushed to the margins of the streets. On average, cars sit parked and unused 95% of the time. This is a terribly inefficient use of highly limited public space that comes at the expense of reliable, sustainable and equitable transportation and deliveries. And today's package um, of bills will directly address this. This is a city where everyone either walks or rolls. We are a city where more than 80% of commuters commute by means other than a car and where a majority of households do not own a car. These are the realities, but the 75% street space allocation to cars does not reflect that. We need to reduce our reliance on large trucks and for the trucks that must continue to operate, we must set up much smarter and equitable systems. Um, just very briefly, um, we, uh, uh, the daylighting requirements in intro 2282 are great. Um, daylighting saves lives, especially with combined with uh, turn restrictions. We also recommend that the daylighting be required for 20 to 25 feet from each Time expired. as recommended by, by NACDO. Um, and uh, we strongly support this package of, of bills today. Thank you. Thank you, Marco. Um, if no questions for these panelists, uh, next we will hear from Matt Bauer. Matt? Starting time. Hi. Uh, good afternoon, uh, uh, Councilmember Chair Rodriguez, members of the uh, Transportation Committee. Uh, my name is Matt Bauer. I'm the president of the Madison Avenue Bid, but I'm here representing the New York City Bid Association, uh, which represents 76 business improvement districts throughout uh, New, New York City. Um, uh, we very much appreciate you hosting this hearing and we recognize the importance of moving goods throughout our commercial corridors to the health and vibrancy of our, of our city. Um, uh, we commend the efforts to address last mile uh, efforts and we think that intro 2253 is a very interesting idea. Just wanna caution the city in, in being directly engaged in, this, in a private sector effort. And um, just to also that any of these uh, uh, facilities not impact uh, retailers and other restaurants that are on the block. Um, uh, we are, uh, we recognize the importance of loading zones in our, in our commercial districts. So, however, uh, intro 2279's uh, blanket requirement that 25% of these, uh, of our zone, uh, of our block faces turn into loading zones would be very difficult. Uh, that usually represents a quarter of the stores and stores don't want to necessarily be in a, a loading zone where there's so many competing uses of our curb uh, from uh, bike racks to fire hydrants to customer parking to open restaurants. We think a more nuanced approach uh, and holistic approach needs to be uh, required for, for the siting of these. Uh, we are concerned about intro 2277's a uh, requirement to extend uh, the uh, parking time uh, to eight hours in loading zone. Uh, to, in loading zone, it would we think turn it into transfer depots uh, that were very, very. Uh, it would not be uh, a, would would not create turnover of traffic. And finally, intro two two eight one. We recognize the importance of buildings doing this, but we have congestion pricing coming on right now, and with the Unified. city's existing off hours program, there could be a lot more to do. So, thank you um, very much for having me speak. Thank you for your testimony. Um, if no questions for this panelist, next we will hear from Kendra Hems. Kendra, starting time. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Chairman Rodriguez and members of the committee. I'm Kendra Hems, President of the Trucking Association of New York. Um, just want to uh, thank the council for their support of improving uh, the efficiency of freight movement in the city. To be brief regarding 2253, the pilot program for micro distribution centers across the city. We support this initiative. We've actually been working with some private industry on this. However, we would encourage that all locations have charging infrastructure versus just a minimum of three. It doesn't support um, sustainable modes of transportation if we don't build out the infrastructure to allow them to charge. On intros 2277 and 79, we appreciate the intent to expand loading zones across the city. We are a bit concerned that the uh, proposed parking rates set a minimum rate, but not a maximum. 
as our drivers are doing everything they can to deliver these essential goods, we want to ensure that they can do so and not be charged exorbitant rates in the process. Um, related specific to 2279, um, the provision that 25% of the curve allocation be for loading zones, we would like to see that be evaluated annually to ensure that that does not erode over time. We're supportive of 2280 and 2281 regarding how goods are delivered to large residential and commercial vehicles. However, we do caution that there is no one size fits all solution to this issue. Uh, trucking industry is incredibly diverse as are their needs. And so we need to ensure that there is some flexibility built in uh, to this legislation. And then finally, on intro 2282, we're happy to see that the legislation calls for the replacement and enhancement of truck route signage. We believe this is critical in eliminating confusion for drivers that are unfamiliar with the truck route network. However, we have been working with the city DOT for several years as they update the current truck route network and we want to ensure that the legislation would not conflict with the work that they are already doing. In uh, respect of time, I just want to thank you once again for your time today. We would look forward to continuing conversation on this legislation. We appreciate the attention to the importance of the efficiency of freight delivery. However, we do feel that there are some areas of the legislation that could I'm be inspired. inspired. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, I believe Councilmember Holden has a question for this panelist. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, Ms. Hems, uh, could, you, uh, could you answer, did you hear my, um, my concerns about the 53 foot trailers being used in New York City? Do you know why your members are using them? I, do, I did hear that and I appreciate the question. Um, the, part of the challenge and certainly not um, condoning the use of um, equipment that's illegal, but part of the challenge is the industry standard across the country are 53 foot trailers. And in fact, it's very difficult for the industry to obtain a 45 foot trailer, which is what would be required to stay within the legal combination length limit within the city. Um, so I don't think it's necessarily a willful violation of the law. I think it's more about um, the fact that many of these companies are from out of state and outside of New York City, 53 foot trailers are in fact legal. Um, and I did want to comment too, because I also heard uh, your comment related to the training. Um, and I do take issue with that. Our drivers are um, trained to drive combination vehicles, whether it's a 40. 45 foot trailer, 48 foot trailer, or 53 foot trailer, they do have the training necessary um, to drive that length of vehicle. Well, um, I, I, didn't, I didn't make that up, by the way. A driver actually said that to me. And if it's if if your members are using, and now it's really the norm, it's not the exception. Uh, the 48 footers or 45, whatever the smaller vehicles, you have to understand New York City has tighter streets than many other cities. We're an older city. Um, if there's a law prohibiting them, then your members should abide by it and not, and not say, well, it's done in other parts of the country. Well, you know what? That's endangering everyone. So if your members are willfully skirting the law by using 53 footers and then saying you're, they're all trained, um, I didn't make that up. Drivers actually told me that. So we need, we need an investigation as to why you couldn't use smaller trucks in New York City because uh, if it's uh, if it's uh, money, if it's the economy, you're also destroying New York City streets and endangering everyone. Uh, pedestrians. My 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 vehicle was uh, that was parked legally on the corner was taken out by a tractor trailer that just kept on going and wiped my car out. And this is happening every day in New York City. So if the industry is going to um, really not listen to the law, then I got a big problem with that. And the industry should get itself together before asking, yeah, before we want to work together, the industry is flying in the face of the law by saying we're using 53 footers and the heck with you guys in New York City. That's what they're saying. Well, and council member, with all due respect, I mean, we're speaking in generalizations here. I don't think to paint the, the industry with a broad brush that they're willfully violating the law is, is fair. There are many companies that in fact do follow the law and do take the extra expense to order the shorter trailers. I'm sure there I are. I think part I'm of the sure challenge is many of the out-of-state carriers sure that come are. into New York City are unfamiliar with the I'm restrictions. Sure there are, but I'll show you photographs of extended cabs blocking streets. because They have extended cabs and extended trailers. And that, don't tell me that everyone is trained to drive those things either. 
Those things are massive 70, 75 footers, and they can't maneuver New York City streets without going up on the sidewalk, endangering everyone, taking out cars and pedestrians and, and bicyclists and so forth. So let's let's get let's get a um, you know a solution to this and not just for decades now ignoring the law. And that's what the industry is doing. And this was told to me by the drivers, okay? I understand that, but we have millions of drivers across the country. So again, I'm it is a generalization based on I'm conversations with specific City. drivers. Thank you. Talking about New York City here, not the rest of the country. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. You're welcome. And, and I think that the most important is, of course, like, I think that the trucking association, you know, overall provide the services responding to the demand of the consumers. I feel that you as a leader, as a voice of that institution at the moment, you just need to take the message back there and say that this case is going on in the city so that you can address it. I feel that, you know, we all should be expected that it's no, there's more percent desire involved in that practice, but it's, you know, cor let's correct it. And, and, and I think that, and it's not, I think the technology is there. You are keeping trucks, uh, or not you guys, I mean, the private company who are members of the institution. The technology is there for them to know where the drivers are. So I feel that, you know, take it as an urgency. Let's be sure that there's no one of those trucks that are affiliated with the institution that are involved in the practice because it affects the image of the whole institution that will roll a thing, provide important service. Without those trucks delivering the food to the city, eh, we will not be able, or people will not be able to get the package in the apartment. So, you know, let's be sure, eh, again, take it back to those members and let's be sure that there's no yes, some member, no one should be involved in that practice. Yeah. I, I agree 100%, Chairman. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, our next panelist will be Ryan Monell. Ryan. Starting time. Well, thank you, uh, Chair uh, Rodriguez and members of the committee. I'm Ryan Monell with the Real Estate Board of New York. I appreciate the opportunity to testify today. Uh, you know, very much in support in regards to what we're hearing today about finding opportunities to alleviate truck traffic in our city, uh, to make our streets more safe and to make our street, streetscapes work better for, for all New Yorkers. Um, we have a few concerns with a number of the bills that were, were introduced today, particularly uh, intro 2281 and intro 2280. Uh, intro 2281, um, as you, uh, I'm sure, uh, have seen, uh, would put together uh, requirements uh, for buildings that are now going to be defined as large traffic generators. Uh, unfortunately, um, we feel very strongly that the, the impetus is put on the wrong uh, individuals uh, in this proposal. Uh, and as a result, um, you know, will be unworkable for many folks, including building service workers, uh, building managers and property owners who are trying to do the best for their tenants, uh, requiring them to essentially uh, put together uh, recommendations on freight and delivery that ultimately is the responsibility for those who uh, are making the deliveries just doesn't make a whole lot of sense. And so we're very concerned in regards to uh, how to uh, implement this proposal. Secondly, and uh, I think uh, Commissioner LaRocca uh, voiced similar concerns in regards to intro uh, 2280, which would require package rooms and essentially all new construction as well as uh, after gut renovations. Uh, I think we have to look in regards to the specificity around uh, what is being required and where it could not potentially work in certain, in, in certain cir circumstances. So uh, looking forward to working more with the council on this as well. Uh, we have a uh, submitted testimony to the record um, for their suggestions. Uh, and thanks again uh, to the chair. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, if there are no questions, are there any questions for this panelist? Okay, seeing none, our next panelist will be Axel Carrion. Axel. Starting time. UPS thanks Speaker Johnson and Chair Rodriguez for holding this important hearing on the recently proposed Smart, Safe, and Sustainable Delivery Bill, bill Package and for the opportunity to provide feedback. We would also like to thank Council Member Reynoso, Powers, and Rivera for their leadership on this legislation. UPS has long envisioned alternatives for a more sustainable streetscape and we're delighted to see that the council has taken a huge first step to address the continued shortage and lack of curbside space available for commercial deliveries. UPS strongly supports intro 2277, 
which would support efficiency by extending the number of hours that commercial vehicles can park in loading zones from three to eight hours. Increasing the time allowed at the curb will decrease congestion and instances of double parking by eliminating the need for vehicles to unnecessarily re-enter the roadway every three hours to find new parking. Commercial zone parking enforcement would further complement these efforts. Similarly, intro 2279's proposal to require DOT to designate at least 25% of curbside space to loading zones in both densely populated neighborhoods and neighborhoods with commercial and manufacturing uses would ensure that there is additional commercial parking to help offset the exponentially growing volume of deliveries in New York City. We believe this will not only make deliveries more efficient, but also create safer streets for drivers, bikers, and pedestrians alike. UPS is also strongly in support of intro 2253, which will require DOT to establish a pilot program of at least 12 micro distribution centers. With intro 2253, New York has an opportunity to lead the way on zero emission alternatives to last mile distribution. In preparation of cargo bike deployments in other metro areas like Seattle and Portland, UPS is excited to expand on the great success realized in Europe in the areas of truck dwell time and double parking, amongst other challenges associated with limited curbside space. That is why UPS strongly supports Resolution 1610, calling on the state to amend existing e-bike regulations to allow different cargo bike models to operate in New York City. We commend Senator Jessica Ramos for her leadership on this issue in Albany and look forward to working with her, the council, and DOT to pass this legislation. Thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony. Are there any council members that have questions for this panelist? Okay, um, seeing none. Our next panelist will be Richard Lipsky. Richard? Starting time. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Um, I represent, uh, thank you for the opportunity. I represent uh, Rosidi Supermarkets, Morton Williams Supermarkets, and I'm testifying in response to uh, Councilman Powers intro 22. 77, which uh, restricts uh, times uh, uh, on commercial loading zones to eight hours now, or extends this time to eight hours. And uh, we had a discussion with uh, staff yesterday in the Councilman Powers' office. I think um, we're in agreement uh, with um, uh, Commissioner Gutman that the bill needs to be tweaked in terms of um, specific areas, especially in front of Super Bowl, or delivering to the store um, where they're supposed to have access. So uh, we would like to see some tweaks to the bill. And we think uh, hopefully that the sponsor is amenable to restrict hours in front of supermarkets so that there is expeditious loading and unloading that will allow uh, those deliveries uh, to occur. So uh, we're in support of restricting uh, the parking, but we think there's a, a need to do it in a more um, targeted direction. And uh, the importance of supermarkets um, should be reinforced by the city. Uh, the e-commerce is taking a big bite out of them. They shouldn't be allowed to uh, prop up all day in front of our markets. And we're hopeful that the entire council will take a look at the bill and Time amend expired. it uh, for supermarkets. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Do any council members have questions for this panelist? Okay, uh, seeing none, our next panelist will be Charles Yu. Charles? Starting time. Good afternoon, Chair Rodriguez and uh, members of the Committee on Transportation, and thank you for this opportunity to address you today. My name is Charles Yu, and I'm the Senior Director of Business Assistance of the Long Island City Partnership, the Local Development Corporation for LIC. We also manage the LIC Business Improvement District and the Industrial Business Zone. Through our bid arm, we want to echo Matt's sentiments earlier in his testimony on behalf of the Bid Association. Uh, we also wanted to share our perspective in our Industrial Business Service Provider hat, where we work one-on-one -on -one with industrial businesses throughout Western Queens. Transportation and freight mobility are very important issues for our area. Many of our businesses rely on commercial vehicles in their daily operations to deliver essential products, services to their customers in Manhattan and beyond. 
We commend the council for highlighting the need uh, to accommodate essential delivery activity and to proactively alleviate the growing conflicts on our congested streets. We will welcome the opportunity to work with you, DOT, our businesses, and other affected community stakeholders on crafting a holistic approach to these pressing issues. While we believe the package of bills is much needed, uh, is a much needed call to action, we also cautious that, caution that these are complicated issues and this is a difficult moment when the rules for permanent open dining and congestion pricing management, just to name two, are being developed and will also have a direct effect on the use of curb space and traffic lanes. Further at this time, when we are still experiencing massive disruptions due to COVID-19, it, it is a difficult time to properly gauge demand and traffic patterns, making an appropriate long-term solution elusive. Uh, we also fear the unintended consequences of some of these proposals, especially when applied so broadly. Uh, for example, the extension of commercial loading zones to no less than 25% of available curb space could introduce frictions with restaurants offering outdoor dining on certain streets and may not actually line up with the needs of those making deliveries. And site selection and implementation of the micro distribution centers could increase the cost of delivery and does not make sense for all types of deliveries. I'm expired. Uh, thank you. And um, Look forward to the opportunity to working with the council, DOT, and businesses um, and other community stakeholders uh, to find a long-term solution. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Um, if there are there any questions for this panelist? Okay, seeing none. Our next panelist will be Jeffrey Friedman. Jeffrey, starting time. Yes. Uh, thank you very much. Um, my name is Jeffrey Friedman. I wanted to say thank you to the chair, um, as well as the commissioner, and also the borough president, because a lot of times the success of these projects ultimately are about the neighborhood. <clears throat> My name is uh, Jeffrey Friedman. I'm the CEO of Building Intelligence and providers of SP3, a cloud to mobile solution for security and logistics. Many of you have worked with our team for specific large projects in the city. Uh, many of the people in the Department of Transportation over the last 15 years have created amazing solutions that solve many of the big problems from many of the big complexes and construction sites. Our Safety Act certified delivery scheduling program has been adopted by many forward thinking facilities, not only to make this city better, construction projects better, to lower traffic and create value, a valuable amenity. As important as it is to solve congestion issues, knowing when vehicles and drivers are meant to arrive as a matter of security and safety are also important. Leveraging investments in security to create efficient operations has resulted in a, bit, in a better city. A lot of the things that you were trying to pass, we're, we're all for. Um, the, the bill sort of celebrates the success of the past that's already been established at One Bryan Park, at World Trade Center, at Hudson Yards, at Time Warner Center, at One Vanderbilt, and many other facilities around the city. Delivery scheduling programs have worked, have lowered congestion, and created a much safer city. Um, it's reduced Pollution, optimized operations support a better working city, a smart city. This is really what a smart city is about. A smart city is about building owners and operators working together in a public-private partnership to enable um, just a better working city. It's not only from the uh, government, but it's also the government and the private sector working together. These forward-thinking owners and operators have put the wheels in motion to support efficient operations in a safer city. The city needs more buildings to coordinate delivery operations to support a safer city. The premise of these systems is to allow tenants and vendors to coordinate and consolidate deliveries to reduce traffic and pollution. Many of you know that some of the vehicles that come Time expired. are half empty. Anyway, we just really wanted to applaud the effort by all the council people, the chairman, the commissioner in the effort to make put some of these things into law that many of the uh, great building owners of New York City have already done. Appreciate your time and effort. Thank you guys. Thank you for your testimony. Do any council members have questions for this panelist? Okay, uh, seeing none, our next panelist will be Thomas Ferrugia. Thomas? Starting time. Hi. Um, Hi, I'm Tom Frugia. I'm Director of Governmental Affairs with the Broadway League. Uh, I have already submitted a long form testimony, so I will just go through this very quickly. Uh, the Broadway League is the commercial, is a trade association for the uh, national theatrical Broadway industry. We have over 400 members who maintain offices in New York City. 
And I'd like to thank the council for allowing me to speak. I'd also like to thank Speaker Johnson and Council Member Powers for sponsoring uh, intro eight, uh, which bill is it now exactly? Um, uh, 1811. Um, specifically, um, I wanna preface my remarks by saying that um, in 2019, Broadway sold 14.8 million tickets. Uh, approximately 46% of those admissions were domestic tourists and additional 19% were foreign tourists. And approximately 59% of all visitors reported that attending a Broadway show was a principal reason for their visit to New York City. Uh, we provided almost 100,000 full-time equivalent jobs and welcomed approximately 40,000 theater goers per day. Combined, Broadway theater had an economic impact of $20 billion on the United States and generated about $675 million in tax revenue for the city. And as we all know, uh, our theaters have been shuttered since March 12, 2020, and New York City is losing an estimated $1.225 billion in economic activity every month that our theaters remain dark. The league has always endorsed legislation aimed at improving the flow of pedestrian vehicular traffic, encouraging visitors and resident access and enhancing the overall quality of life at Times Square. We believe this oversight is more important than ever as we work with legislators and health officials to raise our curtains and rebuild audience confidence in public gatherings. The promise of a safe and orderly envi environment is vital to visitors returning to Times Square. Uh, with respect to 1811, it's important that the council act to regulate what has remained a leading contributor to an unsafe, chaotic, and disorganized environment in Times Square. Time is um, uh, then Thank you very much for this opportunity. And again, we support the I support this legislation completely, and we think it will go a long way in ensuring um, an improved uh, experience in Times Square for our visitors and for our residents. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Are there any questions for this panelist? Okay, our next panelist will be David Cohen. David? Starting time. Do we have David? Okay, uh, we can circle back to see if we get David. Our, okay, our next Panelists will be Regina Fojas. Regina. Starting time. Thank you, Chair Rodriguez and members of the committee for the opportunity to speak today. My name is Regina Fojas and I'm the Senior Vice President of the Times Square Alliance. The Alliance strongly supports Intro 1811 and thanks its sponsors, Council Member Powers and Speaker Johnson for their ongoing leadership in public space management. In 2009, the city created the Broadway pedestrian plazas to manage increased congestion on our sidewalks. Tourists and New Yorkers alike could navigate Times Square safely and have a place to sit, relax, and enjoy public space. Before COVID, the plazas welcomed over 400,000 people a day. In 2016, the council passed Local Law 53 to preserve mobility on the plazas and maintain individuals' right to engage in commercial activity within designated activity zones. However, the city's interpretation of the rule has left passersby open to unwanted bullying and harassment outside of the zones. In 2019, well after the bill passed, 60% of those who work and live in Times Square reported an unpleasant interaction with a costume character, and a quarter of them reported being touched without consent, the impact of which is even more serious post-pandemic. Pre-COVID, when I walked our district, I was stopped at least 45 times by costume characters, CD sellers, tour bus ticket sellers, and people pretending to be monks. If we want New York City to be a post-recovery destination, we must address these conditions before workers and visitors return to our plazas in mass. Intro 1811 does this by building upon Local Law 53 and also establishes a committee composed of costume characters, so it gives them a voice and a forum to address issues before enforcement is necessary. I think that's a very important component of the bill. A time to our recovery is vital to New York City's recovery. If, if visitors feel safe in Times Square, the busiest crossroads of the world, they will feel safe across the city. Adopting intro 1811 puts us further along the path to recovery and lets the world know that New York City is I'm a safe expired. and exciting place to return to. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Are there any questions for this panelist? 
Okay, seeing none, our next panelist will be Glenn Belofsky. Glenn? Starting time. Thank you so much. Right, uh, good morning. Right, before, before we move to the next panel, I want to uh, 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 bring to the Transfer Alliance, of course, always happy to be working with you guys. And, but uh, I know that because of COVID, a lot of conversation that we were having uh, you know, before we were hit with the pandemic, we were not able to follow up. But as a person that led the law that address the Disney custom deer and, and separate the area where they could be. And I just want to be sure that as we continue our conversation on this bill, we continue those pieces that we were discussing before COVID, which is about, uh, we also talk when we pass the law that the Times Square Alliance will be working with the whole uh, theater community in Times Square with the, with the Disney community there to be sure that their resources are not only, you know, investing in the Times Square area because anyone would like to be in Times Square area. Uh, the question is, what about the other plaza? Like how can the, the, the Times Square Plaza adopt, you know, another sister plaza, in this case, in the uptown Manhattan area on the Bronx of Brooklyn, uh, that we can say uh, some of those theater in Times Square, they should only say we can go one day a year and do the performance in Times Square, but let's bring it to the underserved community too. So again, I think that we, we were having positive conversation and I can say that, you know, we learned from lack of following up when we passed a bill years ago. And I know that the spirit there was to correct with pieces where we don't work that we were not following up when it comes to uh, looking for Times Square to work with their partners and members of the board to be sure that they would not only uh, bring the, the entertainment and culture to the Times Square, but also to adopt a plaza in the underserved community. So again, I just want to let you know that I will also be continue looking at, you know, how we uh, will follow, you know, those agreements. I understand how important it is, you know, to expand on the bill that we passed. But at the same time, we need to be sure that the workers there, they are also train. All the workers there, the business custom, they are immigrants. There are many of them documented who they also pay the taxes. So a, a, a few bad apples cannot describe the general behavior of everyone who worked there. So I know that again, we had only get positive a conversation with you guys, but I, more than, you know, the worries about the implementations in order to be sure that all those millions of tourists, hopefully they will come back. All those corporations that get good return from the investment, they also need to understand it. That the reason why we lost most of the people in the COVID being Black, Latino, Asian, and the poorest one is because they are not the one who go to the Times Square area. They are not the one who have to make the money to go and, and enjoy a good a play there. So, you know, I think that there's a lot that we gotta learn from COVID. And one of those is more than ever, to look at the most wealthy one that they are getting ready, that they are the other one who are getting billions of dollars in PPE and all in other federal support also to understand that, you know, New York City had to learn from George Floyd. New York City had to, to learn from, from the coronavirus. It's like anyone can die, but when celebrity die, when a well-known person die, we make it to the front page. Hundreds and thousands of people die. Black, Latino, and Asian, the poorest one, and they are yes known. So be sure that we close the gap on access to culture, pipeline to be sure that it's not in the theater, the Black and Latino and the Asian who play the role moving the cable, but being leadership of those institutions are for me very important as we also work with you guys to work on things that is important for those who make, you know, all the work that work with you. So more than happy to work, but I just want to let you know that I will be looking at those agreements that have been made. Thank you, Chair Rodriguez, and we're happy to continue those conversations with you in your office. Thank you. Okay, uh, now we'll go to Glenn Bolofsky. Glenn. Starting time. Okay, uh, first uh, I wanna thank um, everyone for being here and making themselves available. Everybody's schedule is obviously very, 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 very busy. I think the message today is about unity, how we come together 
to pass important legislation. And so first, in terms of unity, let me wish those who celebrate a happy Cinco de Mayo. Second, I agree completely with Chairman Rodriguez and I do so entirely. The street belongs to everyone, pedestrians, bicyclists, delivery vehicles, and not the least, disabled motorists. This leads me to speak to intro both 2277, sponsored by our friend Keith Powers, and 1141, our honorable chairman. And we want to thank Speaker Johnson and Chairman Rodriguez for committing to passing 1141 to make parking fines fair for everyone and protecting the disabled motorists. Now speaking very quickly and briefly to 2277, I'm hopeful and believe we are all here again in unity to make certain that the hard fought rights of our disabled community are not lost due to a misconstruction of how the proposed law and existing laws work to protect the disabled. Do they work in unison or is there room for a compelling interpretation that no placards mean exactly that, no placards? I appreciate that the administrative code has an exemption for disability permits. So we seek assurance on the record or an amendment to 277 that where it says no placards, it will exclude a ban on disability permits. This way, if ticket agents lean on the no placards language to write us tickets at a later time, we can have the record show that 2277 is leaning on existing law that already carves out an exemption for disability permits. Uh, that's the main issues I have, if I have a moment. The other question concerning, concerning 2277, the intent is wonderful. We agree wholeheartedly. The question of eight hours, um, which would be great for certain companies like UPS, FedEx, Amazon, and we respect their needs. And maybe there needs I'm to be excited. some parking for that. Thank you so much for your valuable time. I appreciate it. Thank you. Are there any questions for this panelist? All right, seeing none, our next panelist will be Jessica Baker. Jessica. Starting time. Thank you, Chair Rodriguez and members of the committee for allowing me the opportunity to speak today. My name is Jessica Baker Vador and I'm the Vice President of Operations for the New 42nd Street. Uh, the New 42nd Street has partnered with the city and state over the past 30 years to create and manage a vibrant mix of adaptive reuses for city-owned historic theaters on 42nd Street between 7th and 8th Avenue. I'm here today to support the thoughtful policies included in intro 1811, and we offer our sincere thanks to the bill's sponsors, Councilmember Keith Powers and Speaker Corey Johnson for their leadership and support of the theaters and businesses on 42nd Street during this very difficult pandemic. Um, <clears throat> 42nd Street theaters between 7th and 8th Avenue desperately need this theater district safety zone designation that's created in intro 1811. Uh, on the east side of the single 42nd Street block, there are five theaters with a total of more than 5,000 live theater seats uh, that includes the New 42's New Victory Theater, which during normal theater operations presents world-class performances to more than 100,000 New York City school children, parents, and families uh, across the five boroughs. Uh, <clears throat> the block is also home to uh, several other theaters and uh, establishing pedestrian flow zones on the sidewalks of blocks like ours with multiple active theaters is just common sense. Uh, the density of the visitors and theater goers that our block brings um, adds to the congestion of the, of the commuters between si the Times Square subway and uh, Port Authority and the uh, very informed and reasonable policy solutions that are included in intro 1811. Um, that regulate uh, the, un, uh, the spillover of commercial activity from the, the, the plazas, like the costume characters and the ticket sellers. Um, it, uh, these, these conditions create overcrowding conditions that bottleneck our sidewalk traffic and forces pedestrians, and many of whom are children, into the street. Um, the crowds I'm block- excited. Thank you so much. I've submitted a fuller uh, testimony, but uh, we really appreciate um, the council's attention to this very critical matter. And uh, thank you for letting me speak today. Thank you for your testimony. Are there any questions for this panelist? Okay. I, we uh, elaborate. Oh, okay. I know that you would take the message what I say. Be sure that your partners follow one thing that we have talked about even though we make the number very well, all of us on the citywide base, but when it's time, when it comes to, you know, and of course I have enjoyed having my two daughters 
14 and eight in many play there and, and performing so, but, you know, making all these things, getting the private sector those who can pay more uh, and raise the money for the underserved to be able to have access to, you know, those events are very important. And again, uh, I will be talking to the, to the community, the cops on this and the cops on too. I want to be sure that with that, you know, they also know that this conversation is going on. I want to be able to work with you, my colleague, but also, you know, the whole idea that a job training program should be put in place for those individuals also to have the opportunity to get a train, to get a good paid job. You know, the city is coming back. The city is coming stronger. Those people make a lot of money in 40 seconds and they should be able to put a fund. They should be able to train those individuals and offer them the opportunity to be relocated. Cannot be only looking at let's change the law so that we can enforce. So I just want to be sure that, you know, as the organizer that I am, more than elected official, I will looking very careful to be sure that from my role at chairing this committee, working with my colleague, those pieces of agreement are in place. I would like to hear from you more details about how you're gonna be a security, not just as individual, but the whole coalition of the private sector in the cultural, especially in, in the Disney who own Times Square. I 100% agree with you, Chair, and I appreciate your leadership on this issue. Uh, the new 42nd Street has a number of uh, job development programs and, the, and artist development programs that we are working on very much in, in this same initiative. So uh, I look forward to working with you on these efforts, and thank you so much for your advocacy on that issue. 100% support it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay, our next panelist will be Laura Rothrock. Laura. Starting time. Thank you, Chair Rodriguez and members of the City Council. My name is Laura Rothrock and I'm testifying today on behalf of Twin America. Twin America provides hop on, hop off, double decker sightseeing bus tours. Before the pandemic, our company served over 1 million customers annually and employed approximately 1,000 union employees representing six different unions. New York City. Regarding City Council Intro 1811, we understand that Times Square stakeholders want better pedestrian flow in the public plazas. However, the language about the sightseeing buses is duplicative of current city policy and doesn't offer flexibility as our city begins to welcome back tourists. We ask that the bill be amended to delete the following provision. No on-street on sightseeing bus stop shall be located adjacent to a pedestrian flow zone. The city DOT provides sightseeing bus stop permits that are also reviewed by the local community board. If there's a problem with a sightseeing bus stop, we work with DOT, the Times Square Alliance, and the community board to relocate the stop. So to legislate where city sightseeing bus stops can be within Times Square seems like an overreach and unnecessary since there is already a public process in place. Twin America has been working with the city council, the Times Square Alliance, and other local stakeholders since the plaza program began. We're deeply involved in the discussions around the activity zones when they were first implemented in 2016. And we wanna to continue to work with the council and all stakeholders to find to help find the solutions that make the city safe and welcoming. We also have offered up suggestions dating back to 2016 to the administration and city council about how to be better regulate ticket sellers, which we have ticket sellers. Um, and we would be happy to revisit those discussions. As you can imagine, the pandemic has devastated our industry and the city's tourism economy. Now that we are over the worst of the pandemic, we hope to work with the city council on ways to invigorate tourism during the long road ahead of us. We ask that you remove the bus stop provision from this bill language and we would be happy to discuss with you further. Thank you. Thank you for your Thank testimony. You. Uh, are there any questions for this panelist? Okay, uh, our next panelist will be Luis Lopez. Luis? Starting time. Hello, my name is Luis Lopez. Sorry. Hello, y'all can hear me? You can hear me? Yes. Okay. Hello, my name is Luis Lopez. I'm an author and motivational speaker. I am disabled. I am a quadriplegic. I'm paralyzed from my neck down. I have a NYCD OT disability permit. I want to start off by saying I appreciate everything Chairman Rodriguez does to help protect me and the disability community. 
I simply hope that intro 227720021 will not remove my rights to use my NYC DOT permit at parking meters. Can the council please reassure me that my disability permit rights will not be taken away? Thank you. Ross, we take a very, you know, our commitment to work with one million New Yorkers that rely, you know, who have physical challenges is a commitment that we have. And so definitely we will be working with, you know, with you and many other voices of the community that, you know, we become, we come out, we become with physical challenges. Sometimes, you know, born with those conditions all the time, it's about, you know, something happened with us, you know, a crash or things like that happening. And at the end, and at the end it's about if we are so lucky and we live enough alone, all of us will be ending, you know, in with, with condition of physical challenges. So when we work and legislate for the community in New York who are one millions, you know, who, pro, who are productive individual, like all in, in any other one that doesn't have physical challenge is our responsibility. So. The answer is yes, we will be working with you when it comes to the need with you and many others with that community that has physical challenges, which is close to 1 million. And but also we are working to be sure that not only it, it, we address things related to, to some the permit that you have the right to, that's what it's, it's, it's something that New York City has established, but also to make public transportation accessible. Uh, we know that many times, if anyone had to take elevator in Dagman in the uptown area and they go to go in the one train, they're gonna to need to go to 231st Street. They had to go to 96th Street in order to take the next a, a train station with an elevator in order to go back to 231st. So I think that you know it's not only things related to the to the permits, but it's also about a new approach and how we need to invest billions and billions of dollars in infrastructure to make New York City street and transportation accessible to everyone. So Luis, thank you for everything that you do. And we are here to say, we stand for you today as somebody else will be standing for us tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you, thank you for your testimony. Um, our next panelist will be Edward Funches. Edward? Starting time. Hello, my name is Edward Funches. I am also a paraplegic. I want to thank the DOT. I want to thank uh, Chairman uh, Rodriguez for always supporting the disability community. I want to thank the, um, the House Speaker. Um, I am also um, concerned about um, Bill 2277. Um, you know, I drive and I drive downtown and that bill states that it, it's, it's taken away our, our, our plaque and we will we, be unable to park down there. So I'm asking, you know, that y'all will assure us that it will not affect us and I'll drive in our, our plaque. Thank you very much, Rodriguez. Thank you very much for DOT. Thank you. Thank you. And we will be, you know, again, I know that Elios and the rest of the thing of transportation, they taking notes on everything. And, and we will have conversation with, again, our colleagues and Speaker Johnson to hear from your concern and identify well how we can work with you. Thank you for your testimony. Um, next, we will hear from Jeffrey Williams. Jeffrey? Starting time. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jeff Williams. I'm also a motivational speaker and an author as well of my feet are off the ground. I wanna thank um, Mr. Rodriguez and the council here today for giving us the opportunity just to share some of these issues with us and having an understanding of, you know, not only with diversity and inclusion being on the forefront, but I'm also a disabled individual who uses a wheelchair and I drive into work every day and having that plaque has gave me the leverage I need to get to work on time and be productive at my job. And I wouldn't want to lose my job because I'm having trouble trying to um, get to work on public transportation, which as you said, is not accessible. And 
I just want to thank you all for considering, you know, that this is a need that goes far and beyond just parking. You know, it gives us access to being independent. It gives us access to being productive in society and giving back in, in society. So I want to thank you all for that reason. Yeah, and, and I assure you that the bill does not have any negative impact with the placard uh, provider that to the New Yorkers we physical challenge you, New Yorker with disabilities. So uh, this is something, again, it's not including the bill. Not only we will be sure that we will protect you in this bill, buying any other things related to make the streets, make transportation accessible again to one million New Yorkers. Uh, who every day contribute to the city in different way, who pay the taxes, who work hard, who are productive individuals. And we need to be sure that we don't legislate on anything that will have any negative impact in your life. So that this bill does not include uh, any removal, any loss or permit for New York with physical challenges. And, and one other question, Mr. Rodriguez, what have you, um, would they have something like put in writing just to, lock us in not only for now, but in the future as well? I don't think, first of all, like what the process work is that again, the bill does, is, does, is not included. This bill doesn't talk, doesn't have any language with that. And I think that no one in the city of New York, you are a powerful group, not only with a million of you, but the voices that you have, leaders that you have, they speak on your behalf, you know, on your behalf every day. And I don't think that any, no leader in New York City will, a think about bringing anything that has negative impact with a population in New York that contributes so much uh, as you do. So uh, this is what I can say. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. At this time, are there any other members of the public uh, that would like to testify? If you could use the Zoom raise hand function. Okay, Chair, seeing none, uh, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you, everyone. Again, uh, this has been a great hearing. Hopefully, we will work around this bill. Again, the bill that you heard today, those bills are now subject to some modification. Uh, we also continue conversation among colleagues, uh, stakeholders, administration. Uh, uh, and again, uh, this is something that we hope that we can work with all sectors here. I want also to take the opportunity, as I said before, to invite any one of you who would like to join us this coming Friday at noon at 166 M Broadway, as we're gonna be co-naming a street or a name of a gentleman from the Caribbean, a very proud that he was born and raised in DR by a person that dedicated his life, promoting the value of ancestor from Africa, one of the right hand of Malcolm X, so we're gonna be condemning that corner of 166 and Broadway after Carlos Cook, but also we're gonna be calling for the reopening of the investigation or the assassination of Malcolm X that also happened there at the, at the border, uh, 165 and Broadway. With that, everyone is invited. This, I cannot promise that I can pay you for a mango, but there's a good mango, rice, beans, and chicken uptown. And more than happy that you can come and enjoy with that. Hope, uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you to the staff, uh, the speaker, the sergeant, everyone who works in the tech to be sure that all New Yorkers have access to this, to this hearing. And with that, this hearing, hearing is adjourned.